Welcome. Uh, this is the uh, SDS War Game Design uh, Speaker Series. Uh, the SDS is the uh, Strategic and Diplomatic Society, which is a student organization of the PSSA, the Political Science Student Association at Concordia University. So it's a series of talks uh, by great war game designers. My uh, philosophy for uh, these for these talks is essentially look at the nuts and bolts of good war game design because. Uh, there's obviously an issue with computer wargaming today where uh, people that uh, uh, play the simulations don't know the underlying mechanic or the math. And so uh, as a pedagogue, I'm very enthusiastic to find out about why uh, uh, certain simulations are designed a certain way and how uh, wargame designers interpret reality uh, and then uh, incorporate them into uh, simulations. The uh, basic format uh, will be uh, an, an introduction uh, from me followed by a pre presentation today. And I'm very happy to have uh, Professor Joseph Miranda, who has designed over 250 games. Uh, he's going to present a, um, uh, give us a, a presentation. So I'm just gonna un unpin this. He's gonna give us a uh, presentation on uh, war game design. And, uh, 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 and then we're gonna have a Q&A &A for half an hour and then a 15 minute break. And then we're gonna have another uh, approximately an hour and a half to discuss uh, uh, any issues really, but uh, I'd, I'd like to talk about China, Taiwan uh, and that issue, but we'll, we'll go wherever the discussion uh, takes us. So I'm going to begin with an intro, a quick intro. So we have some context um, for those that are not with us today on some of the developments that um, uh, Professor Miranda has made in war game design. So let me get, let me get into that. I'm going to share screen. Well, I, in fact, I'm going to uh, I'm going to get, get into this here. Uh, in fact, I'm going to read the uh, I'm going to read the um, uh, intro first before I do the survey of the uh, war game design. So, Professor Miranda is the designer of numerous board games. Um, I should say uh, uh, over 250, as well as being on the design team for several computer games. He's been an editor of both Strategy and Tactics and Modern War magazines. He is currently developing systems for simulating cyber war, hyper reality, and fifth generation warfare. Joseph is a veteran of the US Army and was an instructor in psychological warfare. He's also a graduate of the military police officer course. He holds degrees in history, criminal justice, and political science, conducts seminars on modeling and simulation, and taught university courses on terrorism counteraction. He, he's also been the author of numerous articles and special publications on military history, law enforcement, and modern conflict. Some of his specializations include Roman military history and the small wars of the Cold War era. Joseph has worked in various media, including production, uh, producing radio and television programs. The companies uh, for which he's worked include Decision Games, HPS Simulations, Law Enforcement Crisis Management, Hexagon Interactive, One Small Step, Modern Conflict Studies Group, and Canvas Temple. Some sample games in whose design um, uh, Professor Miranda's participated are Cyber War 21, which is a full spectrum operations in the Persian Gulf. It's a computer game, a hexagon interactive for Air Force Office uh, of Scientific Research. The Battle for Baghdad, which is a multiplayer power politics in the Iraqi capital uh, between 2003 and 2010 uh, for the MCS group. Uh, Afghan Reconstruction Simulation, which is a multiplayer power politics in Afghanistan. It was a seminar game with a law enforcement crisis management component and point of attack series, which is a modern tactical operations computer uh, simulation uh, HPS. So um, I'm, I'm just briefly going to, uh, one second, your, your visual. So let's take a look now at some of the simulations that were designed by uh, Professor Miranda. I'm gonna share screen. And so here we go. So this was a simulation designed in 2000, over 20 years ago, which was a Chinese uh, simulation of a Chinese attack on Taiwan. And I had two of my students uh, play it uh, for an entire semester. And we basically followed the orthodox rules. And uh, this was the first simulation in English at the time of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Now it has a, a traditional uh, rule set, but one thing that you cannot deduce from looking at uh, this uh, a representation of the components uh, is that Professor Miranda had worked in a, a very innovative uh, information warfare component that I just want to summarize very quickly. So we have a context. This is uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, 
So units, land and air units, were rated for C4I, which allowed them to do such things as infiltrate through zones of control. It also controlled whether units could move on a second impulse in combat. In other words, we had a modeling of information warfare. Uh, there was the, you know, there's the traditional electronic warfare component uh, applied to land warfare. But in addition to that, you accumulated information warfare points that could be used for things like operational security, where you could uh, uh, essentially deactivate units' ability to be coordinated by their headquarters, or you could counter that. Uh, there's also the uh, traditional electronic warfare uh, system where you could inflict a cyber warfare crash on a unit, uh, thereby inhibiting its ability to use support elements. There are deception rules that rely on information warfare, as well as uh, a separate model of a psyops, uh, which was essentially information warfare applied to the morale of the both of both sides, which would then affect um, uh, 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 abstractly the overall diplomatic situation. In addition to that, you had uh, a higher echelon of conflict, um, uh, which uh, was described as a swarm attack. Essentially, if you had a critical mass of information warfare, you could have a much higher uh, order effect, including information warfare dominance, which allowed you to move a second in an electronic warfare um, uh, conflict. And on top of that, you, have, you had uh, um, air land battle uh, CRT combat results table, which depended on units uh, having the high technology to be able to, to perform at that level. So in addition to the uh, normal Bronyard hexagonal uh, deployments with helicopters and air units and land units and amphibious operations, you had this whole separate dimension of both electronic warfare and information warfare, uh, which if we look at uh, the conflict today in Ukraine, we can appreciate through TikTok is, uh, e even if it isn't financially or kinetically uh, very important, um, it has a huge impact on who are the allies that line up on, uh, on both sides. So uh, let's take a look at some of the other uh, simulations. Move this out of the way. That's fantastic. Where else do we have to go? <laughs> oh yeah, no, it, it keeps going. So um, here is the uh, uh, simulation of Afghanistan that Professor Miranda designed. I was in uh, Pakistan uh, just before uh, the uh, uh, US and its allies entered in Afghanistan. And this was my go-to game. As I knew the operation was about to happen, uh, I'd just come back from Pakistan uh, for two months and I pulled this game out. And you know, we, we play simulations in order to uh, understand the geography and the layout of the forces and the population and the cities. Uh, but th this gave a, 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 this was fascinating context because it, it had a, a, a very good counterinsurgency uh, component in addition to uh, the normal kinetic conventional warfare uh, element. Uh, and uh, one of the, the incredible uses for uh, simulations is they allow us to anticipate future conflict. And uh, in this particular issue, uh, Professor Miranda explored the American return uh, to Iraq before the actual conflict occurred. And you can compare the simulation with the actual outcome. And uh, while not everybody uh, uh, seeks to make predictions, uh, for those, uh, particularly in political science, that are trying to model reality, making predictions is a, is a, um, a refined way of testing assumptions. Uh, this is uh, a very early game, a Trajan uh, from, I believe, 1990 or 1991. I have it. I've not played it, but it just indicates the breadth that uh, Professor uh, Miranda has. Uh, one thing that Professor Miranda does very well is he has strategic level uh, games which take regional events and put them in much broader context. This is the simulation Belisarius. Uh, it was popular here at Concordia because we could convert it into a multiplayer game with 15 people. And uh, he had an Islamic expansion uh, uh, option, uh, which, which was essentially the same geography, but set 200 years later. And I don't know of any game that, uh, uh, frankly, was as sophisticated in modeling that very interesting period. Uh, here we have uh, Khan, which was uh, essentially the same model, strategic global perspective of the expansion of the Mongols. And again, the expansion could be seen in the context of other operations uh, uh, that were happening. Uh, here we have Charlemagne, again, uh, same concept, very broad view, essentially information overload. You're, uh, to understand Charlemagne, you have to see what was going on far beyond uh, the reach of Charlemagne. Um, I, I also found for pedagogical purposes, because uh, Professor Miranda has designed over 250 games, many of them are key events that 
frankly, uh, anyone who does strategic studies should have a basic knowledge of. Um, I don't. I don't have, um, uh, and many of my students don't have uh, a well-developed historical sense of the uh, uh, 17th, 18th, or necessarily the 19th centuries. And so we go to games uh, to see what the dynamics are. It's a very efficient way of quickly learning uh, what are the, what happened within these decisive events uh, historically. Uh, again, this is um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia set in the First World War. Um, this is Asia Crossroads, um, one of my personal favorites because I'd worked in Pakistan. Um, it dealt with, with um, I, what uh, Professor uh, Miranda calls small wars, but I, I, I think it should probably be described as obscure wars for uh, a European or a Western audience, but are, are frankly very large scale events for people that come from other regions. And I, I visited Uzbekistan, which is depicted here. So. Um, uh, this is Plevna, which is the, the key uh, uh, Turco-Russian uh, uh, battle that basically anticipated uh, the defensive fortifications of the First World War. And again, it, I, I think this is the only uh, simulation of Plevna, Plevna um, I, if someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it, it, it gave a very good sense of, of how could people possibly misinterpret or not anticipate trench warfare from the First World War. Um, this is an urban conflict in Manila, uh, very controversial, and obviously it, it's relevant today because it, it affects the uh, Filipino-American relations if the Americans want to establish base in the Philippines to deal with China and Taiwan. Um, this, you know, I, of course, I live in Montreal, so any game where people uh, seize <laughs> control of Montreal is of interest, and so Professor Miranda simulated that. Uh, the Balkan Wars. I had two students who were from the region, one from Serbia, one from Bulgaria, and, and uh, obviously they had strong opinions about, about the rules. But uh, you'd have to be a brave simulator to, to simulate uh, this particularly uh, complicated conflict. And both of the wars uh, were, were, the first and the second Balkan War were simulated uh, in this game. Um, uh, I, just recently, I had my students play the, the uh, first Arab-Israeli war, very complicated, and uh, it, it actually played out um, uh, I, more or less as, as historically um, uh, it, it occurred. Um, I, again, a, a fantastically efficient way to educate students about how, uh, you know, what the dynamics are for the conflict, and this game had a lot of the diplomatic and the very confusing, um, uh, or not, not confusing, but complex social elements within the country. Uh, this is um, the uh, Soviet uh, attack on Budapest in 56. And, uh, and frankly, I showed it to my grandmother and she thought it was uh, 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 my, just my interpretation of the game that I explained to her, uh, Professor Miranda's design coincided with her experience being in the middle of it. Um, this is a Chosin uh, Reservoir. Uh, this is uh, Port Said of uh, 56. Uh, this is uh, one of the modern war games. I'm showing this because I had a student from the region uh, so a lot of uh, uh, Professor Maranda's designs are, are, are basically contemporary and recent and allow us to, to better understand conflicts that are currently happening. Again, my favorite, Indo-Pakistani war. This was the first attempt to simulate uh, on, on a, a strategic level, uh, the conflicts both in West Pakistan and, and in East Pakistan would later become uh, Bangladesh. And again, having been there, um, my mental map of the region was this game as I crossed uh, the rivers uh, to sort of put a visual on um, what are simply hexes in the simulation. It's a very, very good game. Um, uh, uh, here we have uh, in, in the bottom, the uh, Kaliningrad, which of course is relevant to today. Uh, and I, I think uh, perhaps um, Professor Mander will speak a little bit about this, but this is his upcoming game, Operation Causeway, uh, which is being discussed in a war on the rocks, um, because uh, it, it tells us a lot about the same challenges that China is going to have if they intervene um, in Formosa. So, uh, thank you for the uh, for permitting me to do that extended uh, introduction. And uh, so we have so uh, some of our viewers have a context as to the designs that um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Miranda has has uh, well created over the last thirty five plus years. So uh, with great pleasure, um, Professor Miranda, could you please uh, share your thoughts about war game design? <laughs> well, sure, first of all, first of all, I want to say thanks for everybody for showing up because this is going to be inter an interesting evening. But um, I first got into war gaming when I was in high school and I used to have, you know, Airfix miniatures. I think we could all remember those. 
Well, one day I went to the hobby store and there's a shelf full of these games in these kind of odd looking boxes. And they had titles like Africa Corps and Stalingrad and Blitzkrieg. So I opened one of them up and there was like a whole world in there, a whole world of history and science and math. And more than that, it was like you're part of something bigger. It was like, this is the great era of the Rand Corporation and think tanks. So by playing games and uh, by designing war games, you were like part of this world. And who knows, you could have an impact on the rest of the world and have a lot of fun and uh, convince, convince your family that you'll never want to move out of your, your basement. But anyway, any rate, on that uh, note, what I want to do is uh, a PowerPoint show. And I'm going to share screen. And hopefully this thing will work. All right, there we go. OK. Can everyone see the slide? Okay. Uh, no, not yet. I, th I think it's open, but it's uh, you'd have to press the uh, share screen button at the bottom center. Okay, hold on. Um, okay, is are, are you what, what are we seeing right now? Yeah, we don't see it yet. Um, well, okay, so uh, you you'd have to when you click the uh, share screen button, you want to select the top left uh, window. Okay. All right. I, I hold on a sec. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. All right. Perfect. Now can you see it. All right. So yeah, let me. Perfectly. Uh, perfectly. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Now can everyone see it? Okay. I just want to be sure. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the title of the talk here is "War Gaming Geopolitics: Taiwan to Ukraine." And uh, at, at some risk, I'm going to um, uh, start with the very, very big picture and then show how we get to the actual uh, uh, game design. Well, let's go back to the exciting days of the 17th century when Lion sailed. And this is a game on uh, the uh, essentially the naval conflict between the European powers back in the 17th century when you had great trading empires that were worldwide. And so this is sort of global level conflict. And one of the reasons I ended up calling it when lions sailed was because part of it's set on the Spanish main. So since lions have manes, there was a, a joke there. Okay. All right. We try and work these things in. We try to get a little humor into these things. But basically, you have to think in terms of global level operations. And also in global level economics, I have a whole separate lecture about this. But suffice it to say, much of what we think of today as globalism really had its origins back then with the, uh, the, the rise of the, uh, of, of the stock market in coffee houses in London and Amsterdam. And so uh, the game does cover a whole, a whole worldwide uh, uh, fun. All right, then we go ahead forward another 100 years to the 18th century. This is the Seven Years World War. And this covers the period of uh, the Seven Years War in Europe, but also the French and Indian War in North America, plus the uh, Anglo-French conflict in India, and also um, the uh, Anglo-Spanish War, which was fought out in the Philippines. So it's uh, essentially global level operations. And you can just see these little lines on the map. Those represent global trade routes. So you have to think in terms of both military operations and in terms of economics. So you get the really, really, really big picture here. OK. So what do we mean here by um, geopolitics. This is a quote from Karl Haushofer. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, geopolitics was a field which said basically that the position of a nation did much to determine its power. And to understand the rise and fall of nations, you had to look at its geo geopolitical position, including its control of military, economic, cultural, whatever resources. There are other guys who did this too, uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Spikeman, and, and many others, but they, they had came up with this idea that the world could be divided into two general areas. Uh, you have the continental area, essentially, which is Eurasia, and you have the oceanic areas, which is essentially Britain uh, and, and uh, the Americas. And so the continental area was dominated by armies, the oceanic areas by navies. And the idea was that, well, if you wanted to control the world, you controlled the pivot area, which is as you can see, Central Eurasia, and then that would give you dominance over everything else, and you'd be opposed by the oceanic powers, which uh, would control the periphery, and so they could establish bases along the periphery, and there would this be this conflict to see who would be the top 
the, the, the top person in this thing here. And the reason I showed the risk map at the beginning of this thing is because the game of risk is loosely based on some of these geopolitical theories. You control continents to control the world. Very, very big, uh, very much grand, grand strategy, very much James Bond level villain type of type of stuff, but it's it's kind of interesting. Okay. A couple of American geopoliticians. One was Alfred Thayer Mahan, an instructor at the Naval War College. And his big idea was that, okay, to have sea power, you needed not just a fleet, but you needed overseas bases. And you needed to have a merchant fleet to provide you with commerce. And you had to have the industrial base behind it. And he did much to influence uh, American uh, grand strategy, where we had to have a big fleet now and use that uh, to gain uh, uh, power worldwide. And the idea was that we would tie it in with the uh, British Empire because they too were a naval power. And so by doing that, we'd, we'd have this alliance that could not be challenged by the Eurasian powers. The other fellow there is Homer Lee. He's kind of an interesting character from around 1900, but he had wanted to be a general, but he wasn't qualified for the US Army. So he went out and joined the Chinese Army and which was at the time, it, there, there were various uh, revolutions going on. And so he became uh, a general in the Chinese army and there, there he is in his uniform. But he wrote a couple of books. One was called The Valor of Ignorance, which quote unquote predicted a Japanese invasion of the West Coast of the US. And the book became quite popular in the early 20th century. A lot of people were reading and saying, hey, this is how it could be done. Now, the book kind of gives an exaggerated view of Japanese capabilities. But nonetheless, it's an interesting read. And uh, he became quite influential for a while. Among other things, he, he saw the conflict in terms of these grandiose uh, struggles, where essentially the Anglo-American world would first have to fight the Japanese for, for control of East Asia, and then have to fight the continental powers of Germany and Russia in order to see who was going to be dominant in the world. So again, this very grand strategy type of view and all the other conflicts have to be seen within light of this. All right, which brings me to Taiwan, or as they used to call it, Formosa. Uh, I did a game called Operation Causeway, which is the uh, planned American invasion of Taiwan or Formosa back in 1944, 1945. The idea was that instead of going to the Philippines, we take Formosa, and then use that as a base to launch the invasion of Japan. Also, it was to be linked up with American air power operating out of the Chinese mainland. Unfortunately, I found a very good staff study. And as you can see, it says unclassified. Um, somebody had that stamp, I guess. But at any rate, this is the joint staff study done by the US Army. Um, and it has very detailed information, including orders of battles, logistics requirements, and maps. And you can see there on the right, there's a nice little detailed map of, uh, of a landing. Actually, on Kui Moi Island, the idea was they were going to seize uh, Kui Moi and use that as the base to uh, actually go against Formosa. And all sorts of interesting information, like around the west coast of uh, Formosa, there are mud flats, and it makes that would have made it very difficult to conduct any kind of amphibious landing in the west. So what happened there was they decided to come in at the south because that had the the most viable uh, landing beaches as well as some acceptable ports. So anyway, we did a game on that, and here it is right here. And it appeared in World at War magazine, and there there are some of the units there. A uh, very important part of the game is engineering. You have engineer units, which you can convert into bases, but there are a limited number of them. So you have to think where you're going to put your bases. OK. Well, you have the US victory in the uh, World War II. And a lot of this vindicates the oceanic strategy, because by controlling the seas, we eventually we could, of course, isolate Germany. And by contesting the Pacific Ocean, we could actually um, get back into position where we could retake uh, territory lost to the Japanese. So, and if you go back to the 1920s and 30s, you had all the various uh, uh, war plans that the US developed under the Rainbow Plan series, which resulted in uh, the, a successful naval strategy. And so that's worth looking at too. Well, the result was that 
the United States ended up establishing a worldwide network of bases. And I'm sure we all might have seen similar maps like this. This was a direct result of World War II. In many ways, U.S. grand strategy from that era was to create this network of worldwide bases to extend power and then uh, to enforce things like the Atlantic Charter, uh, the idea being that we'd have a uh, set up an international mechanism to the United Nations to ensure uh, that we do not have a repeat of the world wars. Again, that's a separate lecture, but it's worth looking at. All right, mid 20th century. Um, James Burnham, very interesting character. He had been a Trotskyite back in the 1920s and 1930s. Later on, he became a big conservative. In between, he wrote a series of books which effectively uh, analyzed where we were today. Uh, he wrote his, his managerial revolution in 1941. And it, it, basically what he said was this, that we're heading towards a technocratic future, that specialists are gonna have to control the modern economy. Why? Because it's too complex to be run either by uh, free market principles or by socialist workers. They actually had to have people who are trained. And he said, I don't like this either, but if you want to have a modern economy, it's going to have to be this technocracy. And he wasn't advocating. He's simply saying that's where we're headed. He also pointed out from the geopolitical standpoint that air power and space power would become the new high ground. So whereas in the past it was land power versus naval power, now you have air power and the high ground of space. Psychological operations, in other words, information operations, would become decisive as media became more complex. That included then at the time radio and newspaper, plus motion pictures, and then the emerging field of television. And that finally, conflict would consolidate around global superpowers based on industrial geographic positions. So there would be three of these, North American, Atlantic, Central Europe, Eurasian, and the Japanese Manchurian. And basically, the forces of geopolitics, including economics and military position, would lead to conflict between the three. He also wrote a series of books which provided a basic an outline of strategy for the U.S. for the Cold War. And he was a great big believer in the policy of liberation, of bringing down communist governments. And he had a lot of conflict with uh, the George Ken Kennan School of Containment. That's another story. But the reason I bring this up is that this brings us to where we're going in the future. Okay, so here is Invasion Taipei, uh, the game we did on Formosa or at Taiwan. And okay, there are the components. All right, there, there are several things in the game I want to talk about. Each unit has a combat factor and a movement factor for standard operating procedure, but they also have a C4I factor, okay? Um, and this is important for a number of things. It allows you to use a second impulse of movement. It allows you to infiltrate through enemy lines. It allows you to determine pace of operations by choosing the combat results table the units will fight on. Okay. Now, there are three different combat results tables in the game. There's a probe table. There's an assault table. And there's a uh, airland battle table. And the airland battle table can only be used by essentially units which have a very high C4I. So there's a qualitative difference between different units as opposed to just the quantitative. And there's another factor here too. When developing the um, combat results tables, I made the assault table center your standard World War II, three to one odds, uh, and that's what you need for victory. Well. The air land battle table is, is different. You only need two to one odds to get guaranteed a victory, but there's always a chance the attacker is going to take some losses. And why is that? Well, the idea is that high-tech weapons are also more likely to break down. There's also you're going to have chaotic elements like weather or logistics failures, which are going to more adversely affect high-tech forces as opposed to low-tech forces. So the idea there is if you choose to use the uh, air land battle table, you stand a good chance of suddenly finding your big drive that you thought you had guaranteed stalling somewhere. And you might think in terms of um, in uh, our various Persian Gulf operations where everybody thought they were driving to Baghdad and suddenly uh, they run into a sandstorm and, oh, great, we have to stop for a day until this thing sorts out and clean out the filters. Uh, the, the units in the game were based on the order of battle at the time. As you can see, that uh, they're mainly divisions. And today, things have changed considerably. Apparently, uh, the, the, both the uh, uh, Republic of China, 
and mainland China are going over to a core brigade system. So if we do this again, we'd have to change the scale of the units. We also had that information warfare option there, and you can see the, the IW markers in the lower left. And I like to have something quantifiable when it comes to information warfare. So you get markers. So there, there you have it, okay? The other issue I, I did want to bring up here, and I'll uh, discuss later in the, in the presentation, is that of morale, okay? We don't really know how armies are going to fight, okay? It's been a long time since you've really had any full-scale conflict involving either of the, of the two China's armies. Uh, from what we could see with Ukraine, they pretty much rolled over and let the, the Russians take Crimea and uh, without much of a fight. And then earlier this year, when they uh, you had this the uh, the, the uh, uh, Russian special military operation, they fought fanatically. So morale is going to have to be an issue that's going to be considered, and we'll talk about that a little more later. So we have to look at more at the non-material aspects, as well as the material aspects. And that gets me to fifth generation warfare. All right, this, this has become um, a new, a new, a new uh, theme out there. So first generation warfare was basically linear warfare with musketry. Second generation, World War I, beginnings of mechanization and infiltration tactics. Third generation, armor warfare and the Blitzkrieg. Fourth is guerrilla warfare. Fifth generation warfare, employees, a wide range of technologies, cyber, uh, nano, biotech, whatever. Uh, and it also, the idea here is that you also change the soldiers. So by fighting, you don't necessarily fight and win to gain victory in the traditional sense. What you do is you're also trying to transform the soldiers into uh, a, a new type of force, and it's all very chaotic. You don't know where it's headed. All right. This is a book I picked up from the Rand Corporation years and years ago. Uh, networks and Net Wars, and it's highly worth reading about how networks are used in modern warfare. Now, you look at uh, uh, Osama bin Laden and the uh, Al-Qaeda organization, very much networked, where you had uh, not just, you didn't have a hierarchical organization, you had financial, you had training, you had propaganda, all conducted by the newly emerging internet. Okay, so this is becoming a new field for conflict. And the thing about it is that even if you knocked out one of these nodes, they could be replaced by others. It's very amorphous, very amoeba-like. Uh, when I was teaching a class on uh, criminal uh, criminal justice, I used to use this book because it would describe a lot of what was going on with very ty various types of organized crime these days, where was, where where uh, things were like cartels, or were becoming very very much uh, networked. Okay, and this led me to designing a game here. And this is called Cybernauts. And this had a rather odd origin. I was driving cross country with uh, Kirk Schlesinger. He was a big game developer back in the 90s. And I was supposed to be giving a, a talk about modern insurgency. And finally, he, I was going off about the usual Maoist, you know, model of insurgency. And finally, he stopped me somewhere in the middle of uh, Tennessee. And he said, look, all that was nice back during the Cold War. That's over. Why don't you talk about the emerging cybernetic field and how we, uh, what kind of conflict we're going to see. And then he came up with an idea. He said, why don't we call this data conflict? And it's the first time I think I ever heard someone use a term to describe what is today information warfare. But the idea behind cybernauts is that, okay, you're living in a future world and you have your character and you go around, you see on the left side, uh, this map of the world and you go around to various urban complexes where you pick up programs and then you use them to penetrate the uh, the network, which is shown by the series of abstract square displays in the center. And then you're up against various uh, defensive programs. And as you can see that the various markers here have the names of various types of computer viruses. So you have logic bombs, you have worms. And you also have at the bottom, you can see where it says things like meat puppet and neural implant. You have things that can enhance your characters in the real world. So you can use all this stuff to, essentially, you're going on one of several different missions. It might be sabotage. It might be espionage. It might be revolution. Um, but the idea here is that the conflict was now taking place not in the real world as much as it was taking place in, in, um, in what, would, what was then becoming the internet. Okay. 
All right, so you have the full spectrum of operations, and there's a nice little graphic there, and you can read that. But basically, you have to be able to fight on all fronts, whether it's combat, whether it's guerrilla warfare, whether it's protests in the streets, whether it's the economic field, whether it's the courtroom. Okay, for some reason, they made all these things look like the state of Tennessee. I don't know why they did that. All right. All right, so here are some examples here from the Ukraine. Uh, on the left, there you have the Euro Maiden protest from 2013 2014, uh, which essentially changed the government there. In the middle, you have uh, Russian separatists in the Donbass, and they've set up a barricade in the street. They're flying Russian flags. The lower right, it's what's called little green men. And these are essentially Russians not wearing uh, identifying insignia who've infiltrated into uh, either Donbass or the Crimea. So this is all as much as part of warfare as the big ticket items like armored divisions and air groups and aircraft carriers. All right, so Crimea, a really good example of how all this works. Essentially, uh, the Russians took the whole peninsula without having to fire scarcely a shot. And they did it by a combination of PSYOP, by economic warfare, by um, infiltrating people across the border. And apparently what they did was they offered anybody who defected to their side their full pension. And a lot of people said, well, okay, whatever. And then they consolidated this legally by uh, essentially recognizing in their own uh, parliament uh, that Crimea was part of Russia. So they, they had all the bases covered, all right? And to get to morale, okay, this is, this is a very touchy subject because it's something that's difficult to measure. 2001, the U.S. went into Afghanistan with its coalition allies, and there was, I think, a lot of enthusiasm, and it seemed like we could do just about anything. Well, 20 years later, everybody's headed out the back door, and what happened there? Uh, we need to examine this a lot more to see what psychological factors are at work, what sustains conflict over a multi-year uh, war, and why is it that people who fought hard one time suddenly headed for the hills. Again, this has got to be part of any wargaming, which brings me back to the streets of Chicago. Um, this is a game called Chicago, Chicago. It was done in an early issue of Strategy and Tactics magazine designed by Jim Dunnigan. And I think the old timers might recognize that as a map of Chicago. And this is, takes place during the 1968 demonstrations against uh, the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, and then you had Mayor Daley on the other side, and you had basically a series of riots uh, throughout the city while the convention was going on. And the game is interesting because you win or lose it. If you see on, on the top, there's a thing that says points. Well, the police and the demonstrators each have an exposure index, which measures how, how essentially how bad they look in front of the cameras. And so the idea behind the game is you're trying not so much to destroy the other guy, you're just trying to get him to overreact and push uh, the exposure index in favor of uh, your own side. And so that way you, you may lose the battle, but you're going to win the war. There's another interesting feature of the game is that the effectiveness of units varies depending upon uh, the results of combat. So you might attack the other guy and actually cause them to become stronger because now they're mad at you and they really want to start uh, swinging at you. So very, very interesting design. And it also has three different combat results tables. So they got a lot of interesting stuff in there in a very, very simple design. Um, and I also wanted to comment, I played this with Dr. Roger Mason, and he commanded the Chicago police, and I com commanded the demonstrators. And he actually played a pretty good game. He kept pushing the demonstrators back and pushing the demonstrators back. And I was finally pushed up against the wall at the headquarters of the Democratic National Convention. And then there was a reaction. There was a police riot. The exposure index went up in favor of the demonstrators, and the demonstrators won, and Richard Nixon became president. So it's a very interesting game. I highly recommend it. Okay. Well, at any rate, we're in, in an era of globalism where things are increasingly interconnected, where uh, global supply chains are vital, where everybody can communicate with everybody else. So, I mean, we're holding this Zoom meeting across the continent. So we have to put all this into war games because we can't just see simply see conflicts as being isolated to one small part of the world. So one of the things we can see here is the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And this is China is, is essentially trying to create an overland supply chain through a series of railroads and roads, and also by consolidating some naval bases 
around the Indian Ocean and into Africa. So the idea here is that, okay, this is going to counter U.S. and NATO naval power by having at least a backup uh, for uh, uh, continental level supply, okay? Now, Chinese supposedly have a doctrine that calls for expansion to different island chains. The first island chain is essentially uh, based on uh, 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 Taiwan. Uh, the second is goes out as far as the Philippines, and then others are shown on the map, uh, depending how, how things are interpreted. The idea here is that by controlling these island chains, you control the approaches to China. You also control the naval traffic, and that's vital because they still need to get uh, petroleum from the Persian Gulf. And I see recently there's been some Chinese moves to establish a base in the Solomon Islands, which I think a lot of us can remember from World War II as being uh, the site of the Guadalcanal battles. So that's the big picture, okay? Um, the Russians, their view is that they're trying to oppose globalization with continental power. I have a book there, uh, it's called Alexander, it's by Alexander Dugan, it's uh, called Eurasian Mission. It, it's debatable what the point of the book is. And some people say, well, that's the grand strategy for the Russians. Others say, no, it's just a propaganda piece printed in English to get people to be sympathetic to the Russians. So if you read it, you got to take it with a grain of salt. They do see that continental power can be used to counter the oceanic power and, and globalist power. And their idea is to divide the world up into different continental blocks, which are shown on the map, and each would be self-sufficient economically, and each would protect its own various uh, uh, political interests. So that posits, um, a, 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 it's again, a conflict between Eurasia and uh, the oceanic powers. All right, so let's head over to Millennium, Millennium Wars Ukraine. This is a game I did a good 20 years ago, and it postulated a Russian invasion of the Ukraine. And again, it's a very, I would say, technocratic solution. You have units with combat factors, and each unit has special capabilities. So special operators might be able to do commando missions. Electronic warfare might be able to crash other people. And basically, it's, a, it's part of a series showing how modern warfare might work. Again, this was done 20 years ago. If we had to do it again, we'd be doing other things with it. But it shows a good snapshot of the time. Um, several years ago, Ty Bomba designed a game called Putin's War. And the idea was that it covers a uh, Russian uh, attempt to take over Eastern Europe. And this began a whole series of games that we did using uh, Ty's system. This is one I did, it's called Putin Moves East. The idea is, is a conflict between uh, Russia and China over Manchuria and Mongolia. And I added a development here is that certain units are networked. And the way it works is that if you have network units, you can use one action to move all of them together. But non-network units can only be moved one at a time, can only fight one at a time. So the idea here is a small, agile network force can take down a much larger enemy force. So you, you basically is to use uh, game systems to um, game systems to show uh, a lot of different complicated uh, technological and doctrinal differences there. And uh, an interesting thing about the system is that you have special forces, but when you use a special forces unit, you roll a dice, they don't come back until that number of turns later. And why? That's the time needed to recycle them for training, come up with new missions, develop intelligence. So you really have to think about them as an asset. And do you want to use them all at once to gain a huge advantage or use them incrementally to maintain an edge? So a lot of interesting strategic decisions with a relatively simple system. And one other thing I did with the game is that if you control certain major bases, you get additional actions each turn. So it represents the advantages of forward logistics and major communication centers. Okay, and that brings us to Ukraine 2022. There's all sorts of neat stuff out there. Uh, one, th one thing I would look at is how the initial Russian strategy seemed very close to the strategy they used in 1956 in Hungary, 1968 Czechoslovakia, 1979 Afghanistan, where you basically used an airborne assault to take the enemy's capital, and then you move up your mechanized forces to consolidate. Now, I really think that, that, that the Russians miscalculated here. They thought the, the Ukrainians would collapse, and then they could just settle in and dictate peace. Well, it didn't happen. The Ukrainians, as I say, 
uh, their morale situation. They rolled really well on the morale table and they fought back. And so now suddenly you, this, this is turning into a war of attrition. Okay. This is an upcoming game. It was supposed to have been published a while ago, but then stuff happened that pushed it back on the production schedule. But this is called Ukrainian Civil War. It's still in development stage, so uh, bear that in mind. It's a four-player game. It's set, well, <laughs> it was originally designed around 2019, and it's obviously set before the current war. But the idea is you have four different players. You have the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian nationalists, uh, NATO, and the Russians. And each are vying for power in these different regions of Ukraine. And the idea behind the game is that it's not so much a military game, but as a political cyber game, where you, you're, you're trying to take over various critical cities. And then the idea is that when things reach a certain crisis point, the real war is going to begin. So you have to have the sort of last turn coup where you're seizing as much as possible. And therefore, you're going to be in a position to fight the, the, the real war. And you'll notice the, the areas in green, those are Russian speaking areas mainly. The areas in blue are mainly the, the, Ukra the, the Ukrainian areas. And very interesting because with four players, you get a whole different dynamic. And it should be noted that no player is strong enough to win by themselves. So you have to do some uh, negotiations there to see if you can get a multiplayer victory. Uh, these are the counters uh, for uh, the uh, information warfare markers. And they represent various kinds of unconventional operations. The number to the left is the number which uh, modifies your conventional combat. The number to the right uh, modifies your cyber war. And so you can see, for example, um, uh, the zero day counter in the center there, it's not much use in uh, conventional combat, but it's pretty strong when it comes to cyber war. Uh, then again, you have precision-guided missile strikes, which are good conventionally, but not unconventionally. And there's some special actions there, like uh, you could call in the European Union, and you can um, inflict sanctions on the other side. So it, there's all sorts of fun there, you know. <laughs> One of the things that's in the game is that certain cities will have coups. And when there's a coup, you got to get your people there as quickly as possible because you want to take over the city. Now... Because it's a the, the, the format we use, uh, the counters have to be done as as markers. Okay, I much rather use cards. Now the cards on the right are from the Kason game we did, and what it is is that we just simply put the rule for the marker on the card, so this way you don't have to go through the rule book. And those are a couple of cards from uh, the Kason battle, in 1968 uh, Operation Prairie Fire, uh, for example. And one of the things we find with when you put rules on cards, people will read them. People will, the first thing they'll do, they'll open up the card deck and they'll, they'll, they'll fiddle through them and they'll look for the rules. And it's, whereas if you give people a rules book, they'll, oh, do I have to really read this thing? Why don't you just explain it to me? So there's some kind of interesting player psychology at work there where cards work much better for as a teaching device than do uh, a rule book. All right, finally, uh, let's get back to the big picture here, global supply chains and such. If we're going to look at conflict, whether in Formosa or Ukraine, we have to look at these bigger pictures. And the question is, is, is that, yes, we can fight and win, whether it's Donbass or Taiwan, but what about the bigger picture? What happens if, say, uh, the Saudis decide, well, we're no longer going to align with the United States, we're going to align with Russia because they give us a better deal? And suddenly we find ourselves in a situation where the petrodollar no longer has much significance. Uh, what happens when uh, Russians and Chinese control vital commodities and we don't? Okay? What happens when global supply chains uh, get totally disrupted? And what happens when the other side is able to maintain its supply chains? Okay, so these all have to be put into the game. Now, whether you're going to do some grand strategic game or simply have some kind of uh, random events table, that's got to be figured into it. And this is why we can't just simply look at winning these the battles. We have to look at winning the whole global situation. People have to start thinking really big. All right. And at this point, I'll open this up to any questions. Well, I thought I would take the uh, the sort of uh, the, 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 my privileged position and yes. ask you a standard question I've asked everybody, which is, uh, were you surprised by what happened uh, in the Ukraine? 
uh, before yes. the conflict erupted, what was your prediction on how long it would take the Russians? And why do you think, uh, I'm obviously, obviously you've identified the issue of, of, of it's so difficult to measure uh, morale. But uh, retrospectively, um, what could we have done to um, model it or, or identify the level? Well, I mean, in, in, in retrospect, I, I think you, you, the, the Ukrainians had much higher morale than we expected. Uh, but I, th I think you, you could have had a deck of cards in there. And the idea here is that, OK, each card represents some kind of morale factor. And that perhaps what happened there was that after losing a Crimea and the Donbass, it was like, OK, enough of this nonsense. We get, we get a better card draw this time around. And meantime, you know, uh, because this is a limited intelligence situation, uh, the Russians don't really know what you have. You can even have deception cards. So let's say you have 10 cards, five of them are deception cards. The other guy can look at two of them. He think he pulls the two deception cards. Oh, the no morale. And you really, you do have the good morale. But, you know, th there are tools for doing this. Or there, we used to call it the basic psychological study. And you'd have to sit down and actually... Um, do surveys of, of people's willingness to fight. Yeah, the reason I, but, I you know I, I, I raised this, there's a, an Australian special forces individual who's now a volunteer for I think medical services in Ukraine, and he he has a YouTube channel where he's been uh, interviewing us uh, 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 Westerners who fought within Ukraine over the last um, uh, eight months, and you know it's three separate individuals that he interviewed. One. Uh, and this was an experienced individual, you, you still have very little operational security. If only if only 5% of a community are pro-Russian, they'll cell phone in the location of a unit. Um, Ukrainian commanders still don't share information with their subordinates. So when they get shot, frequently operations uh, go nowhere. And you still have a certain level of, of corruption in that the Westerners, at least, they have to bribe the doctors and the nurses to get medical care once they're pulled, pulled out of the line. So in a sense, Ukraine hasn't evolved. Uh, it still has a certain level of inefficiency and corruption that we might associate with the Russians. So um, it, it is, um, uh, I mean, what we associate with morale is, well, you know what, they've, opened, they've woken up to their national identity. Now they're going to be efficient. They're gonna push all of this inefficient sort of cultural baggage aside, but it looks like they're fighting really hard, but they still have, they have not given up that, that sort of non-Western uh, 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 cultural baggage. They're, they're still in some ways uh, quite Russian. Well, I mean, you know, these are, these are friction factors. And this is why you've got to sort all this stuff out before you go to war. You've got to have an efficient national defense policy. And, and trying to do this in the middle of the war with, with you know, an enemy army sitting on your territory, not, not the easiest thing in the world. Um, you know, so it, it's something that, that people have to look at. But unfortunately, often in peacetime, politics intervene and you never really get there you know yeah so sorry can i ask you to, to stop sharing just so that we can see the questions on the side uh actually sure. I'm, I'm i'm somehow <clears throat> unable to do there we go <clears throat> you know okay, as, as far as um morale goes um i don't know because i really haven't studied it just a uh, cursory glance at the map and some of the language uh um uh, pronouncements there uh, that you see on the maps I would be willing to bet that in Crimea and the Donbass, you've got a lot more Russian ethnic or Russian speaking folks who in the earlier period would have tipped the morale definitely in favor of the Russians. And that once you get past that, uh, then you're into the real hardcore Ukrainians who, who want to put up a fight. I, I like I say, I don't know, but that would be my guess. Yeah, that, that's why we had that thing in the game where uh, the Russian-speaking areas give a kind of a combat bonus to the Russians, the Ukrainian-speaking areas to the Ukrainians. But yes, local support. I mean, this a lot of this goes back to that whole, you know, Cold War era thing that, that you got to have local support to, to get anywhere. And so, again, it's a factor that we need to stick into more games. It's just not, it's just not who has the most armored division, so to speak. So I'd like to encourage uh, those who are attending. Uh, uh, you could uh, put your uh, write your comments down. You can write down a question on the on the side panel, or you could simply uh, uh, appear and then um, um, you know um, make your question. So everyone's everyone's invited to to participate in this discussion. Uh, so so if if I could uh, ask another question, there's again there's a big debate going on in War on the Rocks as to whether an amphibious landing in Taiwan is going to be very easy 
or very hard. You know, given uh, that China's got about 2,000 civilian vessels that um, have been uh, uh, by law designed to be integrated with the People's Liberation Army Navy. What's your um, uh, general sense? Very easy landing or very difficult landing? Well, I, I, if, they, if, they, if those mud flats are still there, it's gonna be very difficult if they try to come from the west side. The, the critical thing here is that it isn't so much landing, it's landing and seizing a port. And that's something I got out of the Taiwan game, uh, the Formosa game, that, that the critical thing is if you can, yeah, you can land, see if you can get guys on the beach, but unless there's a port to bring in reinforcements and supplies, you're you're just going to put yourself into a Anzio kind of situation where you're going to be pinned down. So um, the the other thing is a lot of it depends on what the Taiwanese are up to. Now, again, it gets back to that morale factor that we, I think we need to examine. Um, but th th their their policy, I think it's called the overall defense concept, and the idea here is that. Um, Okay, they're going to fight both conventionally and unconventionally and use asymmetrical warfare and mobilize their civilian populace. So it could just be some huge battle there. But on the other hand, you know, uh, it's if there's some huge cybernetic attack and Taiwan goes down, they lose command control, you know, we've got to factor that into. I mean, when I did the first game on Taipei, it was, I mean, the, the information warfare was still kind of an auxiliary. Now it's become the primary front. Uh, I believe the Chinese have their own cyber army, just as everybody else seems to these days. So that I think you've got to look at the game in, in that bigger picture, that, that, that the military operation is the payoff for everything else. Uh, Mr. Robinson, would you like to uh, ask your question? That says, so other, so other than morale, what elements do you see as most important in Ukraine? Well, I think um, uh, logistics. Um, the question is: Is can you can you sustain armies fighting in modern conditions for a long periods of time? I mean, I think we're used to thinking in terms of these kind of desert storm type of, you know, you win really quickly and then you consolidate. It. Even the same that was true in Afghanistan. Uh, the question is: do, do people have the ability to mobilize and continue supplying their forces in the field? Um, Another another point I'd consider is that our, 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 is that if you went back to like well I, I like to use it as an analogy the Korean War and very I, in many ways I think there are a lot of similar elements here uh, between the Korean War and the Ukrainian situation because you suddenly had, almost out of nowhere you had this attack and the sort of political situation was the same and, the, and so far as the Russians were claiming to reunify Ukraine with with uh, the homeland. And then, you know, the Ukrainians fought back the same way the South Koreans did, and now outside powers are intervening. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the results of the Korean War was the U.S. began getting serious about a peacetime uh, rearmament. In fact, much of what we think of as today's military system really had its origins in various defense acts that were passed during the Korean War. Now, the question is, are people today mobilizing? Are they mobilizing industry? I mean, there are reports the Russians are doing that. What are the Western powers doing? Are, are we suddenly going to be cranking tanks out of, uh, you know, the factories? I mean, somebody needs to look at all this stuff because if you're going to fight the sustained conflict in, in essentially the heartland of Eurasia, you need to be able to support it. I was speaking with one of my students who has um, relatives on both sides of Ukraine, the extreme east and the extreme west, and they'd mentioned to me that Ukraine. If you were to compare it to France or the UK uh, in 1939, it's actually got a delayed mobilization. There, there are large number, large numbers of people who are still working in, in or employed in areas that are not vital to the war effort. So there might be a moral hazard from uh, supplies from the West, but there also might be um, the, the government may, may be far better equipped to receive aid than it is to mobilize its own forces and make those very difficult decisions. But we have another question uh, from Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson, you can always turn your, uh, uh, you can always ask the question yourself or we'll read it. Um, okay, we'll read it. It says, for any game design, how would you assess comparative manpower reserves without classified information? Well, there's um, uh, there these books that, is, that are put out every year. I think it's the International Institute for Strategic Studies. I may be wrong about this, uh, which sorry. actually gives off, pardon? 
That's right. Right. Yeah. Which gives all this information and which gives a listing of, of the latest information on um, orders of battle equipment and so forth. So just crack open the unclassified sources. Well, the books are expensive, but they're worth it if you're doing this kind of stuff. But I'd also point out the question is, is that how much of this manpower is usable? Because it could be pointed out that a certain percentage of people are not physically fit. And a lot of other people, well, the more you mobilize, the more uh, disaffection you're going to cause among society and more disruption. So, again, it's not, I think, like the era of the World Wars where everybody was fired up to fight these huge conflicts and you had massive propaganda systems getting people to fight. Um, so, again, this is all requires immense amounts of psychological studies and somebody needs to do it. So, so may I ask, uh, uh, or rather challenge um, uh, one of your uh, characterizations of, of Ukraine? Um, I mean, I, there, I've seen on YouTube uh, Russian, from the Ukrainian side, Russian electronic warfare jamming uh, down a Ukrainian uh, drone just as it's taking off. So there's definitely there's definitely some element of electronic warfare there. But, uh, you know, aside from the uh, uh, artillery, that, that seems to be quite accurate sometimes. Um, I mean, if you put all the high marks together, it's in, it's in sort of a battalion. I think, I think uh, Professor, uh, was it Professor uh, uh, Camps that corrected me um, a couple of weeks ago. I think it's about that. Um, um, Visually, it looks like it's an infantry conflict, like 90% infantry and, and reserves, and you've got 10% that are mobile and have tanks, and the tanks are sort of widely distributed, occasionally concentrated. There's a bit, you know, a very expensive artillery engagement, but it doesn't seem to be killing that many people. I'm, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's 100,000 uh, dead Russians, maybe half of that, maybe even a third of that. Well, um, I think a lot of it is that people are using a lot of militia there, and they're not risking their... The regulars, I think that's especially true on the Russian side. And one thing I do find odd is that you know the Russians have this huge airborne air mobile capacity, and certainly they were very use, very much using it in Afghanistan. And somehow it doesn't seem to be any massive vertical envelopments. And we might ask why that's so. Maybe there's some countermeasure that's being used against it. But you know, I always think in war game terms, if you have airborne units, you use them and you surround people with zones of control and stuff like that. Uh, another thing about the uh, use of, um, of artillery, uh, the Russians seem to be really enamored with using it against civilian targets for uh, presumably uh, morale purposes. But a right. lot of the, uh, most, the most effective uh, Ukrainian use, especially supported by drones, is to go after things like Russian supply depots and ammo dumps and things, which which hamstrings the Russian ability to generate a lot of combat power. Right. Which makes sense. I mean, you yes. know, destroy the depot units and you're out of supply. I would like to put it in war game terms. So if I could ask you, given your background in psychological uh, warfare, I, did, I mean, this is obviously a, 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 a very, very difficult question. How would, we, I mean, we can see how, we can have a rough, rough uh, assessment of how the Russians are performing. Um, more Russians fled than were enrolled in this, in, this, in the, the first large scale conscription drive. Um, how would we assess the mainland Chinese? I mean, we have one child families, but on the other hand, um, they have access to the internet. They know they have access to VPNs. Um, on, you know, on, on the one hand, um, uh, the communist governments created a, a commercial world for them, so she sh they should be satisfied and to defend the system. On the other hand, maybe they don't want to fight because they're moving towards um, uh, post-materialism. How on earth do we uh, uh, compare the, the individual Taiwanese soldier and uh, the mainland uh, PLA? Um, how, how should we start to make that, that analysis? Well, I mean, the, the, so the standard PSYOP school response would be uh, get some area experts and have them go out up front and start asking people questions and do surveys and interviews. Uh, I mean, I can't give you an answer here right now, but I would say that there's a big difference between today and World War II, and that World War II, people have large families. If you have you know, large families, losing one or two uh, children isn't gonna destroy your family line. When people have one child, then suddenly you lose one child and, you know, there goes your whole genetic line. 
So I think we have to look at all this stuff. Also, back in the era of the 20th century, you still had these very strong nationalist ideologies. I'm not altogether certain if that's true today. I, I'm not sure if people um, today uh, are more motivated by consumerism. And so it's a big unknown question. It's like I say with Ukraine, you know, you would think that that after they essentially rolled over for losing Crimea, that was the end. But no, they they push back. But then again, I suppose you can look at uh, the U.S. after Pearl Harbor, for that matter, after 9-11, that suddenly some incident sparks something. And then, you know, you, you, you roll on the on the morale table and you get this huge boost in morale points and you get a bunch of extra uh, cards and suddenly you go to town. Yeah, but so in, in the in the, uh, the Russian conduct of conflict against uh, Ukraine, is it um, uh, Vladimir Putin and his Siloviki entourage with the backing of 30% of people uh, 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 basically um, tricking a population that has no collective action ability to, to sort of uh, go off and fight in Ukraine? Or is it a situation where you have 70% of the population that are nationalists and do support the general idea of attacking Ukraine? And at the same time, they accept, they, they somehow are deferential enough to accept what is clearly uh, incompetence at the, the higher levels. Uh, which model do you think better represents what, you know, the, the Russian sociological situation? I, I think it's the latter one. I think we're, we're used to a level of efficiency that perhaps the rest of the world isn't. I mean, if you went back to World War II, you could see that the Soviet army was nowhere near as efficient as, say, the American army, but they got the job done. And also there's a lot of interesting psychology there too, where, where World War II is still very much in their memory and uh, Victory Day and um, you know we're fighting the Third Reich and we're fighting the Third Reich in the Ukraine. And so from their perspective, you know, who knows? It could just be that they're seeing this as a replay of World War II. Certainly, I think we see a lot of that today where every time we go up against somebody, oh, it's the new Hitler. You know, so I, I don't know. I, I, I'd say that there needs to be a lot more thorough psychological studies, but that that's why we have psyop departments to do these things. So for, for uh, uh, say, let, say a, a theory of TikTok psychological operations, um, I just gut feeling. Do we have a sort of a standard nationalist model, which is, you know, people want to believe in their own identity because, well, that's basically all they have. And uh, as, as, as sad as, as Vladimir Putin is as a leader, people will invest in whatever leaders available. You know, so, you know, Germans were uh, largely supportive of Hitler, um, uh, even until the 1960s. Uh, I think I think 50, over 50 percent of the population in, in various uh, polls. So, um, uh, uh, I mean, in, 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 in that context, um, uh, uh, can, is there a strategy? I mean, that's another rather peculiar question, but is there a way, since TikTok is there and the Russians are on TikTok and the Ukrainians, Ukrainians are on TikTok, uh, and I, you know, I'm not suggesting the US uh, intervene in a Russian information network. I mean, uh, doing that between Putin and his people is uh, probably the equivalent of starting a nuclear war. I mean, it, it's something very dangerous. And if the US does it, then the Chinese will know what to guard against. But is there a psychological warfare strategy uh, uh, that can be contemplated, uh, that, 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 that can be inflicted on TikTok by uh, government organizations, or um, is it going to be ineffectual um, in, in the way that, in the, way that um, the Serbians seem to be completely unresponsive to uh, 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 whatever moral suasion NATO tried to, to um, impose or rather inflict on them in the late 1990s? Well, I, I'd say that, uh, you know, you have to go after key communicators, the people who make opinions for everybody else, because most people basically follow the leader. I, I doubt seriously if you could convince very many people in, in the Russian hierarchy to change. I, I, the big problem I have with all this is that, you know, in a way, we're still thinking in terms of like 20th century psychological warfare, where, OK, you have a centralized media and you broadcast to people and there's no real pushback because nobody you know you're the only one with the uh the television studio whereas today everybody has a potential television studio and so what was concerned me here is that everybody starts going off in their own direction and you have this well chaotic situation and so i show this you know the slide from of networks and net wars because 
you know, it's it, it, the system is completely different. You have all these different communications nodes. So everybody, it, it can go off in all sorts of chaotic directions. I don't think this has been fully explored yet, actually. And certainly I think we need to evaluate what's going on today because if everybody's going to be their own, you know, PSYOP bureau, well, how do you control this? I, I, mean, I mean, I suppose there are answers out there, but it's not going to be done by the traditional methods. Joseph, you know, one thing um, that the Russians have struggled with is they tightly control what messages go out. For example, what troops can share information and from the field, what people can say, whereas the Ukrainians say, anybody that wants to post something, you know, on any type of social media, put it out. And uh, it's been, I think it's been, that's been much more effective. Now, you don't have as much control, but it, it appears much more authentic. Whereas the Russians, they post a lot of things like troops standing in line, singing patriotic songs and things. Like, and people don't buy that. You know, you see from the Ukrainian side, you see like um, uh, people from a destroyed village cheering as, as the Ukrainian tanks go by and things like that. And that strikes home. People go, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that, you know, right. so. That just might be one thought that the Russians have tried to control their PSYOP so much that it doesn't come across as being authentic when people look at it. That's a good point. And it gets back to the thing that back in the 20th century, centralized PSYOP would work. Today, it's this whole chaotic approach. I think it's much more effective. You just, I don't know, provide general direction and let everybody do their little thing, you know? So... Yeah, I mean, it, it does. I mean, I, I, obviously, a political orientation is decisive. If we see the the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, I mean, it, it took, you know, twenty four hours. You know, as soon as right. as soon as uh, the the Soviets told the East German government, "We're not protecting you anymore," everyone already had a, a sort of a prefab political orientation. I was told uh, I encountered some East German uh, pilots. Um, uh, in, in the Fulung's Academy in Hamburg, and they were still enthusiastically, you know, once once they had a few too many beers, enthusiastically <laughs> telling me um, uh, their plans for defeating uh, the the German air force had there been a, a third world war. And some might, and I frankly I couldn't rationalize it. Why would they be, you know, what? But I was told by my students these uh, these East German pilots came from a, a, a part of Germany that had never experienced uh, democracy. And so the, the sort of the last thing they had was whatever propaganda they got from whatever regime they had. And because everybody needs an identity, uh, even after the reunification of Germany, they still held on to that, you know, sort of as their as their right. identity. Um, sorry, uh, 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 Mr. Isby, would you like to ask that question? Okay, it says new communication technologies, e.g. social media changes mass communications and through up politics. It is the impact of television on the 1960 elections. Churchill's daddy realized that widespread literacy and mass circulation newspapers changed UK politics in the 1870s and 1880s. I, I suppose we can go back to, uh, you know, the first Gutenberg Bible that suddenly once you could start printing stuff and everybody gets stuff, you know, it's a big game changer. Yes, I, I don't think we have fully realized the impact of all social media. It's like... Um, the fact that more people are spending all their lives uh, on social media and they're getting reinforced with quote unquote likes, how much that influences people's, not just politics, but general behaviors. Uh, so, um, but you know, some of this was sort of predicted back in the late 20th century. There were some books, uh, the cyberpunk uh, genre, science fiction, which said that, okay, this, this, this is gonna radically change everything because everybody can get involved in politics and media and finance, not just, you know, people at the top of the pyramid. So it is, this is still developing, but the fact that we can sit here and hold this meeting like this, you know, says a lot. And it's like, what's happening is that, like, if you went back to, well, let's say the 17th century, you couldn't get a bunch of people, world leaders together in the same place because there was a, no real way to do it. You couldn't get... Um, you know, the people who ran Europe with the people who ran China. Uh, today, everybody can get together and not just through media, but through, you know, air, air travel and such. So again, we need to look at how this is all leading to this, this, this whole globalized situation where everyone can be a participant with everything else. It's like one of the slides I showed, showed the, the growth of me, uh, mega cities. And the idea is that, well, if you have all these cities that are essentially have the same interest all over the world, and they're all connected by the internet, 
well, they'll become a force in and of themselves. And then the countryside gets kind of relegated to the to the uh, outlands. And the, the, the real the real power centers will be in uh, this network of 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 uh, mega cities. So there's a lot of stuff is coming down the pike. And uh, that's why we need to keep studying it and gaming it. We need to do more war games. So it's uh, 8.15, so I think this would be a good time uh, sure. to take a break, and so uh, we'll break. Okay, so we're back. So uh, Professor Miranda, I have some uh, uh, very broad uh, philosophic questions um, that I, I, I mean, I, that everyone confronts, especially in the uh, war games that you designed, which are, uh, uh, some of them are, are strategic level and encompass the entire planet. And in, in political science for us, it's, it's the, uh, the distinction between the balance of power mechanism and the bandwagoning mechanism. So that, you know, the balancing balance of power mechanism is there's a threat to the system. People sort of, with some delay, muddle through and eventually uh, 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 deal with that threat and unify, regard, regardless of their their prior relations. Bandwagoning is you look tough and aggressive, and then you compel people uh, to join you. So it's, you know, Xi Jinping acts very aggressively uh, against Taiwan, and this is going to compel them to cooperate. Right. Uh, Adolf Hitler, you know, bullying uh, his neighbors. Um, in your uh, uh, Taipei game, uh, you've made a judgment on that, right? Um, because in the information warfare, you have points that are awarded for uh, what looks like a, a bandwagoning. So as the U.S. inflicts more loss on China, or as China inflicts more loss on the U.S., um, uh, uh, basically you have a bandwagoning system where um, uh, the stronger China appears, the more it melts away its opposition rather than right. provoking its opposition. How do you, when you look at a large system, uh, you know, you might have balance of power and bag and wagoning uh, 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 as mechanisms operating at the same time. How do you choose between the two and how do you sort of feel for that midpoint? Well, okay, like like in the in the Taiwan game, you had uh, a blowback result. So if you push it too far, you you start losing your own information warfare capabilities, and this was a I, this was this was a big factor way back twenty years ago I think, where there was always this concern that if we push things too far there's blowback. Um, but in terms of balance of power, let, let me give you one one second here. I call something up here. Um, there we go. Okay, I'm going to do a brief share screen here. I, I hope everybody can see what I'm doing. Okay. So it'd be, it'd be the screen on the top left, which would be right. The, got it. Got it. Okay. Can, can everybody see this? Yeah, visible. Okay. Okay. Wow. Too many pop ups here. Uh, okay. no, we don't see. We, we don't see the pop ups. Okay. All right. I, I, this one trips. This is this is the game that just came out. It's called Russian Boot South. Oddly enough, it's another game sent in Central Asia. And it, it deals with the uh, Russian conquest of Central Asia in the 19th century. So what you have here is a, um, uh, a, ba a balance of power mechanism. It's called the Great Game Index. And the way it works is that the stronger the Russians get, the more there's going to be a reaction against them. So when they initially start conquering stuff, it's like, well, you know, the people on the other side of, uh, of the desert say, who cares? But then when they start getting a lot of stuff, suddenly they, get, they start really mobilizing. So the player has to consider in terms of, of how much are you going to advance against how much is going to be thrown against you. So it's just not simply conquer territory, collect resources, conquer some more. It goes to um, uh, instead, well, conquer territory, consolidate, think of one of those best time to strike next. Also, if you push it too far, you end up with a war with the British Empire, which is not a good thing. So anyway, that's okay. So, so you put systems in there that that will, that will backfire. So for Taiwan, China, where do you think that midline is between uh, bandwagoning and balancing? Well, I, I think it's if they conduct a military invasion, then all bets are off, and then suddenly it leads to a reaction. So it might make more sense to keep doing all the things like, you know, information warfare and shows of force, and perhaps try and cut some deal with some dissidents within the country to, to uh, get a favorable deal, as opposed to... Um, um, uh, you know, an out and out military invasion that that gets back to that Ukraine game, uh, civil war game is that the, the whole thing, the battle is all fought in the run up, not the actual military strike. And if you screw up the, the, the run up, you're not going to get the military 
payoff. And that's what I think happened in Ukraine uh, this year. Uh, the Russians really thought they were going to roll in there. The Ukrainians would roll over and they'd get the whole the whole country rolled out for them. But that didn't happen. Instead, what happened was that there was this huge backlash. So, you know, war is a realm of chaos and it was pretty much chaotic. Well, I, I, if, if, I, if I could uh, ch challenge uh, you with, with a, yeah. an, an opposing conjecture, uh, you know, the, the, certainly before the U.S. Uh, intervened in the First World War, most of the countries in the world were neutral to the, you know, the, the countries that were not, of course, part right. of colonies. Uh, and the U.S. itself was exporting cotton to Holland into the, the German uh, right. arms industry, and the British couldn't, you know, they couldn't intervene, frustratingly. Uh, with with uh, Latin America voting in, uh, I think it was a month ago, in a U.N. vote uh, condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, I'm wondering if, uh, uh, in this, if China were to go after Taiwan, uh, we're, we're not going to see a recreation of the Second World War of the United Nations. We're going to see a fracturing of the international system and a large block of neutral Middle Eastern, uh, South American, and African states. And, you know, Africa had, I think it's 120 million people in 1945, and today it's 1.2 billion. So they had like a thousand right. percent increase in population. They're now strategically more important. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen, apparently the war in Tigray uh, has killed more people than what's going on in the Ukraine. But of course, strategically, right. it's difficult to figure out what the impact is uh, for the rest of the world. So I'm wondering, you know, your interpretation, um, I mean, you, the U.S. could be fighting with a small number of allies, and 70% of the countries would be on the sidelines playing them off in the way that India is playing off between the U.S. Well, Russia, I, and China. Yes, I, I think that's happening. Perhaps people are just tired of the U.S.-dominated world order, but certainly I see these moves like, like Saudi Arabia giving us a hard time about increasing their oil production. It just may be they're deciding, well, we've had enough of with the, the oceanic powers. Maybe it's time to align with the uh, the Eurasian power. I mean, certainly there have been shifts in these kinds of balances historically. So all, all this has to be considered. Also, I think a lot of this is a blowback, to use that word again, from the whole outcome of the war in Afghanistan, where the U.S. showed itself it could not gain a victory and not only could not win a victory, but in the end, I mean, that photo of everybody running for the hills. You know, I, I think of a comparison in uh, 1842, uh, a British army tried to withdraw from Kabul through the Khyber Pass in the middle of winter with with like like 5,000 soldiers and 15,000 civilians against a hostile tribesman. And, and the story goes, one guy walked out and made it back to uh, 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 what was then uh, uh, British-controlled territory in, in, in the Sindh. Um, and that had a, this huge effect in India because everybody said, well, it looks like the British aren't as invincible as we thought they were. And even though they won a couple more wars, eventually in 1857, you had the great Indian mutiny. And there, there's a lot of uh, thought that this, this that the loss of the British, uh, the British took in Afghanistan did much to destroy the, uh, the, 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 the vision of Britain as being the dominant power. Now, granted, they won, won it all back in the end, but even so, um, there, there's a very big psychological impact in terms of losing a war. And I think we got to consider that a lot more. We can't just sweep it under the rug because it was last last year's news. We've got to sit down and analyze it. I mean, after Vietnam, there was a lot of soul searching and saying, okay, what did we do wrong? How could we correct it? And uh, how can we win the next one around, which paid off with the uh, the Persian Gulf Wars, I think. So. No, I think you're so right. I, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I right. thought Johnson's decision and Nixon's decision to support Israel was looking for a, a, a champion. Um, right. I, mean, I, I recall in 82, the Lebanese shedding American M113s because, of course, their military was, was divided among different uh, sectarian lines. Right. Um, so if, if I can ask another, another question, I asked this to, to Mark Herman. You've designed a lot of war games. You, and less than 50% of wars that are begun by decision makers are won. I mean, most, most of the time, wars right. just end up in a quagmire uh, or, or a stalemate or, or you know, an expensive excursion, and then they make the peace. Do you have a theory of uh, you, know, you know, bad decision making among leaders. Why do I mean you? You design the war games you, from from you know before the the conflict begins. Uh, how how do you how do you explain to yourself why um, we have these leaders who start these wars? Well, part of it sometimes is just bad intelligence information. You know, it's like when when uh, Hitler gave the order to plan for Barbarossa, you know, the the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. 
they thought the best the, the Soviets could do is throw up 200 divisions. And of course, there are another 160 divisions waiting to be mobilized. And I think there's a line somewhere in one of Hitler's uh, conversations that well, if I knew they had that much, I would not have started this thing. Well, you know, looking back, I guess, looking back, we would have all invested in whatever stocks they're going through the roof these days. But a lot of it, I think there's this element of self-delusion. You start thinking you're invincible. You start thinking you can win everything. And certainly, I think this was a major problem with the Russian government. They thought, well, we rolled all over uh, you know, the Donbass, the Crimea. We got our settlement in Chechnya. We could do it again. And you know, it's like there are only so many rolls of the dice before you get that attacker eliminated result. And so I, I'd say that, that, that once you're winning, kind of stop and consolidate. Um, also, I think if you look at like the same thing with the Japanese in World War II, had they simply stopped at the at the line that they originally planned to defend, they would not have gone for the battles of at Coral Sea and Midway, which had all sorts of implications down the line. Not that they necessarily would have won the war anyway, but certainly things could not have gone much worse. So th there's a lot of self-delusion there. And I think you've got to have a government that's willing to have a brutal look at what the, the facts are and not be deluded. And unfortunately, that, that isn't going to come about, not very often. So can I make a, a demographic comment and get your reaction? Yeah. Um, I, I, I did a calculation, and, and the, the Russian under 30 population is uh, two thirds, uh, sorry, one third smaller than the American equivalent population because uh, the unstable conditions between 1990 and, and you know, of course, the present time uh, was too unstable for people to want to have large families. So when I look at the conscription of Russia, uh, it looks like they're all over 30. So it looks like the under 30s have sort of, you know, said, I'm not going to, I'm going to avoid conscription. I'm just going to leave the country or I'm going to hide in, in, you know, my dacha right. in the countryside. And this is sort of the last roll of the dice of uh, that generation that has a nostalgic memory of the, of the, of the Soviet Union. Um, does that sound plausible? I mean, from the videos, it looks like, they look like my age. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's possible. I think you know, big issue here is those of us who were brought up during the Cold War, we still think of this sort of apocalyptic struggle between the communists and the free world. And I'm not sure what the um, what the, what the mind view is of younger people, because like like I said, I, I, if this if if China were to invade Taiwan back in say 1980, there would have been this huge battle. Today, we don't know what would happen. Would one side or the other just simply not fight? You know, would, would they fight it out really, really uh, like another Verdun? And I think that that's got to be examined. And like I say, that this, this is an opening here for a lot of psychological operations people to figure out what's really happening. I, I think one thing that's kind of significant is that China, really neither China, has fought any kind of major battle for decades. I mean, the last time the Chinese army was employed was, I think, in 1979 against Vietnam, and that didn't turn out too well. And uh, so we don't know. I have heard of a general proposition, as a general, not universal, that when two opposing countries are absolutely sure of what the correlation of forces is and who's likely to be the winner, that you're not going to have a war. It's when there is doubt as to what the outcome could be, that's when you're going to have a war. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I think that's yeah. from Jeffrey Blaney, the Australian military historian, in his book, Causes of War. He said, if both sides have complete information, you're never going to get a conflict, right? Because the, the, the weaker will submit and the stronger um, can get stuff for free. But James Fearon wrote uh, a counter piece like 30 years later where he said, you can never, ever do that because people always have an incentive to lie. If you're too strong, you want to look weak. And if you're weak, you want to look strong because if you share information about your true strength, you'll be exploited. So everyone's always going to lie. So um uh so jeffrey blaney's uh, 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 proposition it's it's um it's unattainable unfortunately um well that's why I, I think you need to have like when you start playing a game if you have cards which represent capabilities and and intentions so the other guy doesn't know what you have and then, then it really becomes fun so if I can, I just ask a very quick counterfactual. Um, yeah. If we have the same technology we have now um, and the U.S. were to go back in time to Vietnam, would it have made any difference? No, no I don't think so. I, I think it's because, well, you know, <laughs> this is a whole lecture, but I think the ultimate 
center of gravity for the communists in Vietnam was not in Hanoi. It was in Moscow and, and Beijing. Ultimately, it's because they wanted to continue supporting the North Vietnamese, that the war continued. And so no matter how many trucks we destroyed on the Ho Chi Minh Trail and no matter how high the body count got, it, it didn't make a difference because they could replace their losses because ultimately they're getting more stuff from the outside. Um, so I, I, I really think that the real problem there was that the grand strategy that, that well, my view is that what Johnson or Nixon should have done was sat down with the Russians and said, look, stop supplying the North Vietnamese. We'll give you all the grain you want. We got to fight this thing out on our own, and because we can't fight you and the Vietnamese, and th that was was a major problem there. I mean, this is there's a lot more to it than that, but basically, as long as the Hanoi knew they had Moscow behind them, they knew they can go on fighting, and therein lies the problem. So, if we look at the current fighting, we you know Russia has yeah. some quasi allies that are providing uh, munitions, like North Korea and Iran. Right. If China were to go for Taiwan, it's got its nominal sort of uh, uh, orbital right. client states. We've got North Korea, sort of sort of Pakistan, sort of Myanmar, and then you got you know quasi BRICS like South Africa uh, and Zimbabwe. Um, who do you see? Uh, I, 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 you know, going back to the the sort of the perception of the communist threat in the fifties. Um, uh, in, in your estimation, is China, if they go for Taiwan, kinetically or or in a blockade or in a bombardment? Are they going to go uh, alone, or uh, uh, do you? Do, I mean, do you think North? Korea, do you think there's a scenario where North Korea and Pakistan coordinate somehow with Beijing? I know it's sort of the nightmare scenario, but um, uh, are are the are the uh, sort of worst case I, analysts wrong? Or I, I don't. I, I'd say that Beijing cannot afford politically to be seen as being supported by outside countries. They have to show that they're. That this is a, an affair between Chinese because the whole idea is that they still claim Taiwan is part of China. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what these other countries could provide there. I mean, other than sort of strategic distractions to keep the US from intervening. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, I, I don't want to make any predictions because then, you know, <laughs> it's wrong and then suddenly people throw this back in your face. But there, it'd be interesting if there would be some wider Eurasian war and that we're just on the cusp of it. That, that's the thing that we have to look at, that that prior to World War I, I mean, everybody thought the thing was going to be over with, you know, by um, the end of the year, and it, and it certainly wasn't. So war is the realm of chaos, and let's 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 keep that in mind, and we keep the number of die rolls to a minimum, you know? No, I mean, it makes sense. If, if Iran were to intervene to help yeah. China by taking advantage right. of chaos by closing the straits, China would be the most right. hurt, because they're the ones right. who export through the Straits of Hormuz. So it's not clear what Iran can do. Pakistan, I don't think yeah. under, even knows where tai, Taiwan is. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at the current missile launches by Myanmar, and I'm thinking at the back of my head um, that uh, uh, Kim Jong-un wants to look relevant because he thinks the U.S. is in uh, Europe when I think only the 101st is in Poland. So the U.S. has right. not committed much at all in Europe. But I think Kim Jong-un right. might just not be watching the news or something and sort of burning off his, his rockets. Um, so if, if, if I may ask you uh, a question about the sequence of attack, um, when, when uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, I thought, you know what, okay, so uh, when the war starts, because it's, it's politically hard to start wars, the U.S. must attack on the land at the same time as they're doing a bombing campaign. And as it turned out, they had a lot more political flexibility, so they could just bomb Iraq. Right. Uh, for a very long time, and then you know have this you know a, a final final attack. What's your instinct uh, on uh, what China is likely to do with Taiwan and the sequence uh, in which things are going to happen? Well, first of all, I, I, I'm not going to dictate their policy, <laughs> uh, but I, my view would be that to use the combination of of shows of force, cyber war, and whatever to new, to uh, neutralize the island. In terms of an actual invasion, well, there are all sorts of contingencies. One might be to try and just simply create some kind of deal where, okay, we're going to reunify you with the mainland, like with Hong Kong, and you still get all sorts of benefits, but you're, it's, you're still going to have certain um, uh, obligations to us. Because I think they think very long term, and so it doesn't necessarily have to be some kind of blitzkrieg. Um, but in terms of an actual attack, I mean, I... I 
<laughs> I'd imagine what they would try and do is knock out their uh, the Taiwanese command control first, and then use that once they're neutralized is just to follow up with an invasion. But again, this the idea of a horde of of boats and 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 planes crossing the straits. I don't know. I think that the Chinese have a lot of don't may not want to risk that because if they lose even one of their I think they got what, three aircraft carriers, big prestige loss. I don't know. I think. They're also looking at the Russian situation and saying, well, if this turns out into a protracted affair, it's going to really hurt us. So, yeah, I mean, Hector Bywater, I think I've got his book here. Yeah, I, I, I oh, yeah. guess sort of the, you know, his, his World War, uh, World War II in the Pacific sort of right. uh, journalistic estimation. Um, uh, I mean, they, 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 there's, there's two models, which is the, uh, the Chinese go for Taiwan, the US does its best from Okinawa and Kyushu right. and Guam. And then um, uh, Taiwan will be half occupied, and then the U.S. is going to somehow build up a, a intervention force with air cover right. and it'll land on the East Coast and start feeding in. Uh, uh, I know the U.S. Army doesn't think they're going to get involved at all, and, and the Marines are doing entirely island hopping in the South China Sea, so we're not going to get anything. Apparently, no one's getting ready to intervene on a large scale in uh, Taiwan. Mark Herman suggested it would be the other way around, which is that the U.S. is going to go in big real, with, with carriers and aircraft, and then they're going to exhaust all their munitions. And then we're going to end up with a month, two month long. Uh, uh, the U.S. is not a, just not able to intervene. Um, I mean, it, it sort of harkens back to the uh, the idea that you know a, a Pearl could easily send the fleet to Luzon and save the Americans and the Filipinos there, but ultimately they, you know, at, at the moment of crisis, it was uh, good deterrence but bad defense, and they, there was nothing they could right. do. Right. Um, so uh, I mean, well, I was, what do you think of the, the sort of the, the that, that that sort of model of the U.S. goes in quickly and then just runs out of ammo because this is high uh, modern combat missile dependence. They're very expensive and there's very few of them. Right, I I, I agree. Um, it's like it's like you know how many um, ammunition points do we have? You know, and 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 since you're expending munitions, you know you've got to be able to replace them. And I mean, again, do we have the industry that can suddenly start? turning out the production lines. Now, I like to give as an analogy here, okay, we're always talking about, you know, everybody's talking about, well, World War II, have to fight Hitler and so forth. But if you went back to the run up to World War II, the US was getting prepared. There was this naval rearmament program. Uh, you did have the first peacetime draft in American history in October of 1940. So everything was geared up. So when Pearl Harbor happened, you know, you had all this stuff in the pipeline, and even then it took a couple of years to get it fully mobilized. Now, are, are we just simply, you know, have sort of a one-shot operation here? I mean, these are questions that I'd, I'd like to see answered somewhere, perhaps some huge game on, on mobilization. Um, another point I'd bring up here is that I see a lot of, there's a lot of talk about hypersonic weapons. Okay, but if you went back to prior to World War II, there are a lot of weapons that were supposed to be really effective that didn't turn out so good. I'm, we've all heard about, about the US torpedoes and they 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 weren't effective. Actually, the German uh, torpedoes at the start of the war also were ineffective because they didn't test them under wartime conditions. What it was is they had like some kind of magnetic trigger. And the idea is they get some proximity to a ship that detonates. Well, when they tried using them in the North Sea, they found out the magnetic anomalies were enough to throw the torpedoes off. And suddenly they were firing torpedoes and it was just just nothing. And that's what I see with all this equipment they have today. Yeah, it looks good on a firing range and maybe in computer simulations, but are we actually doing this under combat conditions where, you know, where there's countermeasures and fog of war and, you know, somebody didn't do the proper preventative maintenance and stuff doesn't get out of the silo. So all this, I think, has to be factored in. It's like, um, look at operational rates for equipment. Normally, you can assume that X percentage is down. Let's say if you, if you have like 70% of your stuff running, okay, you're doing good. Well, in the opening of a war, what's it going to be like when nobody has any combat experience? So I don't know. That's got to be in there. You know. So Do you know what I, you said there on, um, on the, uh, the new weapons? That's mm -hmm. the only excuse for Ukraine is you get to test your weapons there. That's true. It's like the Spanish Civil War before World War II for the Germans. Right. It'd be interesting oh. to evaluate how this stuff is working, actually. Yeah. 
So what would you think are the, or this is also for, uh, uh, for Professor Camps, what do you think are the, are the lessons uh, that we can draw about technology and what lessons do you think the Chinese might be drawing? I'll let Charles go first. <laughs> oh, um, oh, I'm sure things like uh, the, the use of drones is, uh, is a big one. That's probably the, uh, that, and that's one that I didn't guess. I thought the drones, hey, they'd be really good in, uh, in the kind of war we're fighting in Afghanistan, but I thought they'd have a really short lifespan in, uh, in a high intensity war, but it, it appears that they're doing really well and, and really making the, uh, making the artillery a lot more effective. What, what do you think? Well, Roger asked me, he texted me a question. What happened to Russian hybrid warfare? They did not employ it as expected in the Ukraine invasion. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, a lot of the stuff that they had, like cyber war, a lot of these other techniques just didn't get employed. Why this is so, I'm not sure. Perhaps there's sort of a hubris there. They thought they were just gonna roll over it. But I always like to think that, that okay, the weapons are nice, but ultimately it's the non-material factors that are decisive. Um, but in terms of it, if you, if you have all these drones and stuff, well, it does it does add this extra dimension to things. But again, we have to see how it works in the long run because you can can you keep replacing these? And I suspect though you can because a drone's a lot cheaper to produce than an airplane. So, uh, if I could share with you the answer I got from Mark Herman last week, uh, he said yeah. uh, 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 first he uh, him and Jim Dunnigan in their next war game of, of, yeah. of the future conflict of Europe in 1979, they had individual units representing electronic warfare. He said those represented broadband jamming, which don't work at all. So the Soviets, right. or rather the Russians today have these very powerful, that'll run right. havoc with your cell phone service, but won't affect military grade equipment. However, he also said in areas like the South China Sea, where you have large open water, uh, drones will not work. You still need aircraft. Right. So drones are short range. Um, so I, I have a, a question against, you know, hypothetical, hypothetical here, uh, US, well-equipped uh, full spectrum air defense from uh, local to, you know, uh, uh, lo you know very local to local to, to theater air defense. Uh, when we have two symmetric well-equipped sides with full spectrum air defense, is that not gonna diminish, I mean, or how much is that going to diminish if at all the effect of drones? Well, from my understanding, it does, it does diminish it, that, that it, they are, that drones can be shot down, but I'm, I'm not, don't have any technical information on that. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, my view is that, you know, you know, when you talk about a weapon system, okay, you got to look at drones, sort of like helicopters or like um, uh, air, air, tactical aircraft. And not necessarily as a, as a separate system. It's a way to extend your reach and, uh, your observation capability and interdict people, but by themselves, they're not going to be decisive. I just think of them as a stronger zone of control. Um, you know. um, as, as far as the Pacific goes, um, yeah, the little drones are probably only going to be good for the Marines on those little island chains where they're trying to stop some ships from going through. But we also have some very large drones that are out there that, that cover thousands and thousands of square miles of of uh, reconnaissance area that um, uh, Navy versions of, uh, of the US Global Hawk, I guess it is, and, and some other, uh, other ones that they're putting on uh, aircraft carriers now that, um, that, are, that are, you know, that not, not short, not the short range of the little ones that we're talking about in Ukraine. Yeah, I, if I could share, share a, a, an account with, with uh, Professor Herman, he was looking at, um, uh, ground-based radars and the fact that they they actually don't penetrate foliage very well even today because the amount of content you have in the leaves and so uh, if you're going to have a drone uh, identifying a target it's almost always going to have to be some sort of visual algorithm or some machine learning way of um, I was I'm just I, I don't want to reveal how incompetent I am especially to, to uh, uh, Professor Camps who had some tanks but I was driving in Gagetown to the base in Canada with a column of my engineer vehicles we stopped because um, uh, uh, an American column passed by and they waved at us. And we thought it was some sort of bizarre alert. People don't wave in the Canadian army. So we stopped the column to find out what, and we were told Americans were very, uh, you know, we're just sociable people. But we stopped next to the road and there's this bizarre telephone pole that looked like it had fallen over coming out of the bushes. And I, I was there for 30 seconds thinking this is the strangest thing I've ever seen. 
with my sergeant. We just looked around and we saw, you know, grinning teeth. Um, so someone had been able to camouflage their vehicle not 10 feet from where my Jeep had parked. Right? So I, I, I consider myself a fairly intelligent person. I assume the drone would probably have my IQ. Um, so with conventional uh, camouflage, you can hide a 50 ton vehicle in a tree line. Uh, you know, if you can maneuver it correctly and you have sort of the right uh, material to put on, put on top of it. Um, if it could fool me, I mean, I, I, you know, obviously I didn't have that much experience, but my impression is that um, drones are gonna have a significant drop in effectiveness. Uh, once you have a peer competitor um, uh, uh, to, to a U.S. type of system, and it's going to go back to, you know, hide behind an, an, an element like cement, which which limits the propagation of electromagnetic uh, signals, and uh, so it'll it'll you know go back to being normalized, which is you know use a shovel to avoid these things. And, and yeah, and once you get once you get into positional warfare. Oh right, that's true. So if you're in maneuver warfare, you can't do that. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so are there any, uh, okay, here, yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Isby, would you like to ask that question? Oh yeah, you, you have it. You observed that there's a, a, the great big Triton UAVs on Guam. Um, so I, again, I'd like to invite uh, uh, those who are here to ask questions. You can ask it uh, verbally. You can put the question uh, in the bottom. Uh, may, may I ask a, a, a strategic question, um, uh, uh, Professor Miranda? You mentioned before, was it, uh, I, Forgive me, but is it is it pronounced Bur Burham? Burnham? James Burnham, yes. Yeah, Burnham. Um, uh, I, I I've never heard of uh, of him before. If you forgive my ignorance, of course I know I know uh, George F. Kennan's uh, strategy. Right. What with regard to uh, a China to Taiwan scenario? I, I mean, I think Kennan's strategy would be uh, put a put an economic cordon, allow the middle class to develop, and eventually their regime is going to change because the, the population is going to you know, a, a demand a less authoritarian system and that will demilitarize the society. What was Burnham's, um, Burnham's um, alternative strategy? Well, he, he was a big, he became a big proponent of the strategy of liberation and basically supporting Chiang Kai-shek and returning to the mainland eventually. Oh, but so he saw back. the main, yeah, rollback. But I'd also say that if you looked at his earlier works, he would have said, well, it didn't really make a difference. Economically, Taiwan would eventually be integrated into China as one great big, you know, uh, economic zone. So um, don't worry too much about it. I, I mean, it depends. At different points in his career, he had different, different views on things. But his, his book, I think the managerial revolution is worth reading because it does you have, quote, unquote, an explanation of how um, uh, the modern industrial system was changing the world. So that's why I always like to wave it around. No, I mean, I, I think I think it is. Uh, I mean, of course, rollback um, right. was ideologically very powerful. Right. And it was the promise for uh, right. Warsaw Pact countries that were under Soviet occupation. And right. uh, I, it, it had the promise of it, even if it was never executed. Um, and to some extent, the threat of it obviously kept the idea alive among the people there, which is why the system collapsed so precipitously once right. the, once the signal was given. Um, uh, 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 yeah, for, for there to be a collapse. Um, so again, are there? Yeah, I'm looking for questions. Uh, questions on the side. Um, so, it, um, I mean, gosh, there's so much to ask about uh, uh, China and Taiwan. Um, uh, I mean, one, one thing about your your game on Taiwan is all we can, we can we can actually just update the values for the aircraft and right. the ground units as, as you suggested, just have sort of core organizations with with component brigades, and the game will still work. You know what? I think I'm actually going to do that. Um, okay. uh, you know, to see uh, uh, because the basic mechanics are, are are what we have now, and of course the information warfare components are are still there. Um, so you do have in the rules an element for special weapons, right? I know people don't like right. talking about it or do like talking about it, but um, right. <laughs> uh, uh, we, I mean, we have we have the sort of the credibility problem, which is the U.S. Uh, uh, is is implicitly um, telling, implicitly threatening, but it's not entirely clear how telling Russia do not use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. But the U.S. of course does not want to uh, have kinetic interaction with the Russians because it could escalate. With China, the U.S. must have kinetic interaction with China in the first 24 hours, right? And so there's, there's a linkage issue, which is the Chinese are hoping, you know what, the Americans are afraid to, to engage the Russians. Let's do the same thing. 
let's get let's create this nuclear umbrella, uh, and so we can fight under it. Uh, and so we, you know, in, in in academically, we have a test of two basic ideas, which is that nuclear weapons are a fantastic deterrent, and then we have you know the stability instability paradox, which is if you got nukes and I got nukes, they cancel each other out. Now we're safe, so we can shoot at each other. Um, like India, Pakistan, right? After they tested their nuke in 1999 or 1998, and 1999 in, in Cargill, they can they can shoot each other. Nuclear um, weapons make the world safe for conventional warfare. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Professor Camp, you believe that to be yes. true? Uh, but if if I mean uh, uh, for you know for for a civilian, they look at a nuclear weapon and they simplify it. But you know we know that there is a a, a huge scale from you know, 50 minimum deterrent local weapons to thermonuclear weapons to, um, uh, you know, a full range of strategic second strike and tactical. And then you get into the into the arsenal of tens of thousands. I'm wondering, you know, perhaps the instability, the stability instability paradox doesn't click in on that full spectrum. It actually doesn't work at the lower levels. Um, what do you think? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a problem with Taiwan and China is that, is that, Taiwan is the producer of most of the world's chips. And I mean, even the ones that the Chinese use as aside from the ones of ours. So they can't lay waste to it by hitting anything that's important or anything in an urban area that produces this stuff or they're killing themselves or cutting their own throats. I mean, that from the economic side, that, that, would, make, that would make a difference. Yeah, I'm thinking of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and Louis XIV basically kicked out the Huguenots, and then the Huguenots went in 14 different directions, taking their the, the you know the 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 uh, 17th century equivalent of, of chips, and you know they led the economic boom in Holland and England and Germany. Right. Um, so, uh, uh, Professor Miranda, what do you think? Well, I mean, I mean, I always like to say again, war is the realm of chaos. I don't think there's going to be any nuclear play, and I think essentially. If it comes down, it'll be conventional. And from what I can see that that of the Russians, they only claim that they're going to use nuclear weapons to protect their territorial integrity. And even then, I suspect the border areas might not, not apply as territorial integrity. I don't think they'd use them for Crimea. Um, but yeah, it's a good point about the chips. Um, certainly, it's one of the reasons why car prices are so expensive. Um, <laughs> And you know, this is a bigger question, though, is that we need to rethink a lot of our economic policies, because if we're going to take vital economic, you know, industries, and, and stick them right on the, the doorstep of what could be a hostile power, you know, it, it's it's not such a good idea. It's like, what if you know? I, I try to think of an analogy. <laughs> what if the Romans had put, you know, they the, the, had one sword factory and they had it right on the border of Germania? And it was like, you know, one, one, you know, invasion over the Rhine and, oh, no more swords. So there, there needs to be a much better thinking of, of industrial policy. And again, it gets back to my point, like during the run-up to World War II, we were thinking about these things. Today, it doesn't seem to be that it, there's no serious thought about them. So yeah, I mean, I mean Taiwan, Taiwan beat out Singapore and South Korea for that top tier uh, ability to produce those high demand chips. I mean, we can't always choose. I think I think uh, Professor Camps was deployed somewhere in front of the Ruhr Valley because you know you, sometimes you're stuck with right. the most productive industrial area in the wrong place, and you really have no choice. Um, uh, so I, it, it, I mean, if, if, did you see the war with uh, a war, a Chinese war with Taiwan as being a sort of a, a a Falklands War kind of Argentinian gamble, and then when it fails, there's a political upheaval, or is it going to be a, a protracted uh, almost like the Spanish enduring rivalry with the French and the English, which went on for a hundred years. I mean, is, is China... In terms of an actual war, it seems that if they get ashore and they move inland, they've got the island. But on the other hand, if they don't get ashore, then there's, I think it's going to be a political disaster for them. Like, again, if you, the point about Falcons is, is well taken. It did much to bring down um, their government, at the time, uh, the Argentinian government. Uh, it's the difference between that and Ukraine. Ukraine is a ground war, and you could, that could turn into a contest of attrition. But um, I don't know. Of course, there may be some wider naval war in the in the Western Pacific that breaks out, and that you know, if you the Chinese were able to seize some you know islands further uh, east, 
they, they're now in a different position. We might want to start looking at World War II Pacific games. Of course, it's doubtful they could move up much up. They could invade Japan or uh, the Philippines, but you know, they can make life difficult. Again, those um, hypersonic missiles. Yeah. You know. No matter how the actual war went, um, authoritarian regimes uh, have sometimes a uh, proclivity to launch an external expedition or war when the right. internal situation gets pretty bad. Like when we were mentioning here, Argentina and the Falklands. I think when the Argentine um, inflation rate hit 400%, that was when they said, oh, we better recapture the Malvinas. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it hadn't put much more thought into it than that. And it didn't turn out well for them, but at least it was the motivation for them to do it. I don't know how that would happen, roll out with the Chinese, but, you know, there's always a possibility. Right. So may I ask that same, essentially the same question uh, for uh, Russia? And, you know, it's a lot more complicated for Beijing. I, does it not look like there's an implicit strategy, which is, you know what, let's get you, I mean, you know, for, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of avoidance about what, you know, what Ukraine should ultimately look like, because of course there's a population that's Russophone and, and Russian, but isn't there an implicit strategy, which is to keep the war going until Putin is thrown out in a coup? Well, the problem is, is that that could work both ways. I mean, it could, you know, when you consider the energy situation in Europe, the fact that gasoline prices are, are spiking out here, that it could lead, you know, you know, it, it could lead in both directions. Also, uh, if you look at go back 100 years ago to the end of World War One in 1917, you had the czar was replaced by the provisional government. And then in October, you had the, the Bolsheviks. So there may be even more militant people out there in the wings saying, OK, you no more Mr. Nice Guy, you know. So we need to consider all that. I, it, you know, regime changes, you know, it's it's a really big th overthrow of the dice. I mean, we couldn't even make it work in Afghanistan where we had an army on the ground. Can we make it in places where we don't have, have troops? So I don't know. The regime change thing needs to be thought about a lot more. Sorry, you gave me. <laughs> Sorry, can, can I ask you to uh, uh, why the U.S. succeeded so well in in aiding the consolidation of the Seoul regime in South Korea during the Korean War, and so poorly in Vietnam and Afghanistan? Was there a different well, te technique, or uh... yes, I, I in 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 Korea, we basically had control and we were given the orders, and not only that, you had the threat of a conventional invasion. Which, which was pretty much obvious to everyone that they had to get their act together or else. In Vietnam, the, the political situation was always up in the air because we didn't, want to, we didn't want to come in as the French. We didn't want to say, okay, you're just our colony. So there was a lot more flexibility on the part of the South Vietnamese government uh, in terms of what they could do. And there never was any unified strategy. In fact, if you look at it, there never was any theater command for Southeast Asia there. I mean, you had, you had too many players. You had MACV, and the U.S. Embassy, and then you had other people running around in uh, Laos, you know, trying to fight the, the North Vietnamese up there. So that, uh, unlike Korea, where you had, you know, first of all, MacArthur and then a Ridgeway and some others as, as commanders in the Far East, and they could give orders and everybody respected them, not the same in Vietnam. So you, you needed a, a, a unified command, you needed to get things under control, and that, that didn't happen in Vietnam. So what do you think is happening with U.S. advice to Taiwan? So we're, I, I mean, I on, on, on the scale of Korea to Vietnam. Uh, I, I couldn't say. Yeah, I, I, from what I, you can't, I can say on that front. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually hoping to, to, to uh, I, yesterday I was making a list of uh, Chinese professors at, at three different universities who do polling work. And I thought I would email them to ask them if they could tell me. Because it is, it okay. is a, a mystery to me what precisely the, the Taiwanese think. I spoke to a Taiwanese soldier about two weeks ago, and uh, he was an electrical engineer forced to do his service with a maintenance company, and he had nothing good to say, basically. It's, it's okay. a, very, a very chill environment. They don't really have a sense of urgency. Uh, it, I, it's a, sort of a combination of fatalism, and we're only going to survive if the U.S. moves. And so it's, it's yeah. sort of you know, a, a, a yes or no type of uh, a situation. Um, can I ask you to comment on a conjecture, which is if the, I have a conjecture, which I, I, I wrote in a, a national interest or as a real clear defense, which is that if the U.S. doesn't base in the Philippines, 
they can't possibly uh, win in Taiwan because Okinawa and Guam are either too far or they're, they're basically up the coast. So to fly from Okinawa to Taiwan is, is ridiculous. You're basically, your, your flank is exposed the entire right. distance to uh, Chinese surface air missiles. So the, the US has to negotiate their way. And right now you have Marcos Jr. in Manila and his father, of course, you know, he, he's, I think it was a, a $3.2 billion uh, court case against his father and his, his, his possessions. And his father was apparently, his grandfather was apparently a collaborator, collaborator with the Japanese who was captured and killed by American sponsored Filipino guerrillas. So uh, there's a sort of a huge political thing there. Um, I was wondering if you have a, uh, uh, is that a correct conjecture? Yes, actually. I mean, it goes back to the old war plan oranges, you know, that you need this chain of bases across uh, the Pacific. And Philippines, you know, are, are just in the right position to be, well, the central position between Japan, China, and uh, Southeast Asia, and certainly, you know, Korea and Vietnam possession of the Philippines did much to, to uh, well, I don't say possession, but alliance with, did much to uh, uh, provide air and logistics supports. And then during World War II, the, the Philippines, uh, which were a possession at the time, uh, you know, were, were that great big base, and so they all had everybody was planning everything around the Philippines. So it's like we've given up the, like, you know, the set the queen on the Pacific chessboard there. And mind you, there were political reasons to do so, but even so, somebody's got to think about this, this that sort of glaring gap there. It's like we've got the flanks covered from Japan and from Australia, but not the center and, you know, facing the, the what could be the main foe there, so. And Vietnam's not likely to, to grant any basing. I'm not sure. I, 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 it'd be ironic if we went back to Cameron Bay, though. <laughs> but yeah. uh, so, you, of course, you've designed many games that have shown the strategic. We, we spoke. I mentioned this question. I think like uh, uh, an hour ago or so. You, you've designed many uh, games in the in the uh, uh, 18th and 19th, uh, sorry, 17th, 18th and 19th uh, right. centuries. If we were to do <laughs> one involving uh, a China-U.S. conflict over Taiwan, uh, one of the key assumptions is. The, the, the Chinese cannot blockade Taiwan because the Americans are going to instantly reciprocate with an effective blockade. They're going to shut down the Strait of Malacca right. by putting, you know, uh, littoral combat ships and just, you know, take a right. registry of every ship going in there. How do you see uh, the blockade plan? Is this is this uh, uh, overconfidence, easy to do, or um, it's going to well, be? I, yes, I think I think it would be because I think the one advantage that U.S. does have. Is an experienced navy, but there are other things that would interfere here. One is the uh, whether or not they could use the Belt and Road Initiative to open up logistics through the center, granted at much reduced capacity. Also, could the U.S. survive this when we get a lot of our stuff from you know from China and even Taiwan, which presumably would be cut off? So, could this just be a case of us all going down together? You know, that, that, that any such game has got to have this wider economic component. And without that wider economic component, it's it's just it, it's just not there. So, of course, it could just be that both sides make an agreement. Well, we'll just limit the conflict to um, essentially uh, the uh, Taiwan and Taiwan region and everything else still gets to flow. You know, I mean, it's not unreasonable it's, it's to think in those terms uh, I was but, interesting, I mean, interesting, sorry yeah go inter ahead. interesting hey. proposition is uh, prior to world war one the prevailing um, opinion was that uh, no war could last more than a few weeks because the right the economies of all the european nations were intertwined and that uh that, it, that it, they'd all come tumbling down if you tried to do anything more than that well i guess the war actually showed that, that was not Exactly. Operative. And you said the same thing yeah. to some degree with Germany in World War II, because it's always like, well, if we don't hold the Nicopole bridgehead, we'll run out of molybdenum or whatever. Well, they lose it and they still go on fighting. I mean, so th th there's a lot of reserve capacity out there and and uh, that that for an economy. So, you know, but this is a, I thought this is Ivan Block's book, who is the, uh, oh, the right. banker. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he's a very thick book where, you know, uh, uh, 400 pages of, of course, World War One will be a very long slog because of the ability right. to mobilize large numbers of soldiers. Um, but I, I was actually wondering in terms of allies. I mean, in Second World War, Brazil was 
a victim of German submarine warfare, so they deploy two divisions to Italy. Um, right. I'm wondering if the U.S., when they declare the blockade, they're suddenly going to get uh, two-thirds of the world going, no, you can't do that. And then I think uh, that's possible. Yeah, I mean, I, and, and, yes, I mean even, even U.S., I mean, in part, a particular, uh, uh, a, a country like India is going to go many different ways. Uh, because they, you know, they don't want, you know, a, a, a certain element of free riding. Um, most countries have this sort of peculiar uh, uh, sort of bifurcation of interest. You have Saudi Arabia selling oil to, to, to the Chinese as well as the Indians. You have Iran, which has got good relations with India because they sell oil to India. Although, you know, it, it varies every couple of years. So uh, a lot of countries are, uh, that, you know, that, that are energy providers are pulled between two alliances. So they're going to, you know, play a, a double game. Um, uh, I just thought that would be something you know interestingly modeled by one of your uh, strategic level games. Right? Yes, you know China's going to pick its champions. Um, uh, I, I, I sorry, this this goes back to Soviet military power things that I was reading in the 1980s. Peru has always purchased weapons from enemies of the U.S. Um, for reasons that I'm not entirely sure. And I've had students from Peru, and I've asked them, and and the the Peruvian elite are actually hyper hyper Europeanized, if that's a peculiar expression, where they, they, they more than anyone else in South America, they try to trace their lineage um, back to Spain. And I, I think oh, it's because okay. the society is so heavily indigenous, you have a large Andean component, but I was always just, you know, wondering, um, you know, if, if China's got these sort of pre-established uh, anti-regional hegemon uh, countries that are going to, you know, so easily side um, uh, with them, and I, you know, I don't think Cuba, frankly, is a big candidate. I, I think the uh, the regime in Havana, their days may be numbered, but uh, a country, Peru is not an insubstan unsubstantial country, and it's nicely located. And it was, it was actually on the slide that you showed us. Um, it was one of the uh, brick and road initiative ports uh, that's been uh, fitted into the system. Um, right. uh, again, it'd be curious to know. I mean, I don't know why, um, but it's it's the kind of uh, well, you know, the kind. I think we're used to thinking in terms, and we, I mean, people over the age of 30, we're used to thinking in terms of the Cold War, where everything was this great big struggle between East and West. And I don't think we're adjusting to the fact that, that the world is becoming less divided that way and more into these, well, continental power blocks. And certainly a lot of people, I think, are seeing that they can play balance of power by shifting towards, say, Russian or Chinese alliance, and thereby undermining American power. So I think all that's got to be considered. There's, there's a lot of balance of power issues, and we just can't go on this assumption that everybody's going to line up be behind what the latest directive uh, from Washington is. So, if I could ask another question uh, that has to do, which I think is very visible in, in uh, European and US politics right now, which is, this, this peculiar alliance between um, uh, uh, domestic politics and international politics. Um, I, when the US was hit at Pearl Harbor, I think the one vote against the US declaring war on Japan was by Jeanette Rankin, who was, I, I think, yes. a, a labor activist. And in France, you had um, Prime Minister Bloom, who, when he got into power in 1932, said that um, we're going to disarm France completely. And this is a signal that even Hitler himself can't misinterpret. Um, and so, you know, we, 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 we're, we're seeing in Eastern Europe, uh, obviously, there's a certain component uh, that's energy driven, which is people with lower incomes are suffering. Um, but in the U.S., you see um, uh, what looks like a, a Lord Ha Ha. I think, it's a, is it Mosier? I, I can't remember his name in England. Um, but you have what looks like a, a, a Vladimir Putin trying to ex, uh, ex, uh, exploit uh, left-right politics in, in the domestic politics of other countries. And I, I think Vladimir Putin even used the term woke. In one of his speeches, which I thought was peculiar. Well, yes, I yes, that that is part of their doctrine to exploit divisions and enemy. But then again, that's that's been true of most powers historically, where you try to exploit differences in the enemy by uh, using psychological operations, propaganda, subversion. So it's, I mean, it's nothing, nothing particularly unusual. But I would say that if we're going to get into this conflict over the Ukraine, that we need to have better leadership. Uh, if you look at, regardless of what you think of uh, President Roosevelt, at least there was some leadership there to say, okay, these are our goals, this is what we're going to do. I, I don't see anything today. It's like, again, it goes back 
to the lack of mobilization. Okay, if we're going to suddenly confronting a war with both Russia and China, potentially, shouldn't we do something to get prepared for it? Like, again, uh, how about gasoline rationing? I mean, if we want to go back to World War II, you know, you, this way we can get maybe get gas prices under control and, and sort of share the pain of, 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 of doing this. But there doesn't seem to be any real leadership out there other than the, the sort of uh, uh, press conferences where everybody says, you know, the, the kind of the raw, raw stuff, but nobody's really thinking this thing through. I mean, certainly if you went back prior to World War II, you had all sorts of war plans and people coming up with contingencies. And today, I, I don't see any of that kind of effort. Maybe I'm just not cleared for that kind of information, but we need to be debating this seriously. I mean, if we're going to go to war, I mean, if we're going to war with Ukraine, okay, you had granted declarations of war kind of seem to be out of favor. But, you know, with um, Vietnam, you had the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, and you've had various other things that at least give some kind of legal authority. I don't see that happening today. What I do see happening is that people are just simply doing whatever it takes to um, look good in front of the press briefings and not actually come up with a viable strategy. And, and the problem is it's easy enough to look back on World War I and say, well, they made all these mistakes. And that's why this thing went on for four years and led to the collapse of everybody's governments. But, you know, we're we stumbling that way today, too. We need to consider that. Well, I'd like to get your reaction as someone who's within the U.S. When, you, when, you, when you're describing a lack of leadership, actually, yeah. um, from, from outside the U.S., the U.S. Right. looks like it's taking exceptional steps. Uh, in, in fact, U.S. is taking more steps today than they, they were under Roosevelt. You know, at the time of Roosevelt, you had a very strong anti-war movement that's, that's right. uh, much stronger than it is now. Um, uh, within Canada, I'm, I'm curious what the U.S. thinks of Canada's foreign policy or, or, or what, the, what Americans think of German foreign policy. I mean, if, if, they're, if, they're, if there are free riders, I mean, extreme free riders, it's um, uh, Germany and Canada. Canada, their, <laughs> our, our defense spending is going downward. And uh, you know, from my research, the reason the US puts no pressure on Canada is that Washington is very concerned that Canada is very brittle. So if they put any pressure on us, we're gonna fragment into three sub countries and then it complicates your, your diplomacy. But Germany, uh, I'm not sure if it's some sort of passive aggressive thing or um, uh, I mean, if, if anyone has a, I, I, sorry, I was reading something about um, Angela Merkel um, raising the issue of energy dependence on Russia 10 years ago with one of her uh, coalition partners. And uh, she, she discovered she couldn't move anywhere. She would have, her government would have collapsed if they had done anything. So um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, uh, um, the US is actually showing remarkable, uh, I mean, I, I think they're showing remarkable leadership considering. Um, I, I, sorry, and if I could get your reaction to this, I'm wondering if, um, uh, a component of it is uh, the, the idea that China is actually far weaker than we think. And so, for, you know, from the from the George F. Kennan theory, it's, you know what, we, we, we got them into the uh, World Trade Organization. They're slowly becoming capitalist. All we got to do is wait just a little bit longer, and then they're going to collapse. So just, you know, keep the faith, uh, uh, believe in the revolutionary power of democracy and, and consumerism, and, you know, don't blockade them. That would be the worst thing you could possibly do. Yeah, I, I've I've heard that, but I don't know. It, it, like I say, if we couldn't get this to work correctly in Afghanistan, where we had control of the country more or less, I I don't think we have some superpower to change things. It just may be that that things are shifting away from an American centric uh, world to this this multipolar world, and so that we don't really have the capacity to really um, influence stuff that much. I, I just, I, I, like I say, we need to reevaluate what went wrong in Afghanistan. That should be the, the primary topic of things. I did want to bring up another book as long as we're talking about the run up to World War II. But this is a very interesting book. It's called Tomorrow the World, very provocative title by Al, uh, Stephen Wertheim. And it deals, I mean, even despite the title, it's about how uh, U.S. Um, uh, diplomatic establishment set the stage for the post-war American order uh, during the 1920s and 1930s. And they saw essentially World War II as the opportunity to create that world order. 
And it's actually, despite, I mean, the title is, is, is really great, but it, it's actually very sympathetic, to, I think, to the American position. And I think, you know, one of the points that you, that's made in the book is that the reason you could have that post-World Order, World War II order, is because the U.S. did have the military and economic dominance exerted through oceanic power, I mean, through both military bases and free trade. And the question I'd raise is, do we really have that kind of power when you're talking about trying to dominate the Eurasian heartland? It's just, I, I we, maybe we're overextending ourselves here. Well, I, I recall uh, uh, something along those lines. Um, Vedemeyer, I think his name was, Vedemeyer, he was the American, uh, I think he replaced Stillwell as the, the, the senior advisor in China, the, the senior military attaché in China. And, um, uh, after that uh, position, he was sent around the world um, as a senior U.S. officer to identify all the bases that the U.S. would, you know, use after. And he just he details this in two um, uh, autobiographies. So, so, you know, definitely it looked like um, it, it looked like the the, the post-war U.S. position uh, was premeditated. But I mean, frankly, it was not hard. I, I think it was not hard to organize. The Americans invited India's representatives while they were a member of the British Empire, and the British could not right. object because they're receiving USA. So the Americans are already planning to dismantle uh, the colonial empire. And frankly, Correct, that was, yes. I mean, that was a position that um, uh, the majority of people in England supported, which is why India was doing independence so slowly. I mean, the, uh, the British Prime Minister Gladstone had played with the idea of getting rid of India in, in the 1870s because he couldn't figure out who was benefiting from this. And it certainly wasn't uh, the class of people that he was representing. So um, uh, the U.S. is moving in, in the correct direction of history, and I, I'm, um, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm actually a lot more optimistic uh, than you on U.S. grand strategy because uh, the U.S. getting involved uh, in, uh, um, in Ukraine, uh, Biden could have avoided uh, uh, some of the gains of the conservative, isolationist, nativist elements in the U.S. by, by cutting back aid, but he's not. So to me, it looks like some sort of um, uh, sort of deep state plan for uh, a template for you know a, a, a post Putin world order. Um, so it does, I mean, it looks like at least there's a plan there. Um, I, I'd always hoped Canada would be sort of like a Belgium prior to World War One, where we would you know uh, do more than our fair share, like the Belgians. Right. Um, but of course, we're not. Canada's an extreme free rider. Uh, along with you know a great many other countries, and you know the way Europe plays itself out, the English are of course they need America to counterbalance Europe, so the British are, are along with you. But France basically just wants to, I think, uh, be the head of the NATO navy in, in the Mediterranean, so they're not with us. And you know it, it, Italy basically follows France and Germany, so you have this sort of uh, this free, free somehow free riding structure, and uh, uh, you know pr probably the best U.S. ally is Poland, I think right now, and you know besides the English uh, uh, in Europe. Um, so, um, uh, so I, I'd like to add, again, uh, for those that are here, I mean, there's actually, there's, there's uh, uh, a squad of people who are here. So if anyone would like to ask a question, um, you know, uh, uh, please uh, uh, join in and um, uh, share with us your, your comments. Um, can I go back to uh, some uh, red lines? You mentioned that there would be, that there, it's very likely there would be uh, an implicit limitation on conflict. So uh, uh, the chi China and the US will not suddenly be knocking satellites out of orbit, right? Because that would be, um, you know, it, it, once you're shooting satellites down then you're undermining deterrence, right? Because then China can't right. see if the US is firing rockets at them and then sort of second strike was at the window and they become uh, very insecure. Uh, and the US, the US right now, I think they have 3,000, they probably have 6,000. But I think they have 3,000 warheads that are um, deployable strategically. Um, and I think the, the balance are sort of stored tactical weapons. Um, so, uh, I mean, going back to a, a, a US-Chinese confrontation, the Chinese have, I think they're building 300 silos um, in different parts of the country. Uh, they have, I was shocked to hear, uh, seven or eight Jin-class ballistic missile submarines. And I think they're going for a ninth hull but I might, I might be wrong there. And then, then they've got their mobile system. And uh, China's road network is now um, uh, the same as the US's. So they have a lot of roads where they can put these mobile vehicles, unlike, you know, unlike say India, where they have, I think 5% of the US highway network. And so their mobile 
they, they, they have mobile systems, but they can't, they can't go anywhere. Um, uh, so uh, uh, you, you, you mentioned before that you don't see um, uh, China engaging in the kind of, a kind of radar, uh, a saber rattling that Putin is, um, because he's trying to uh, uh, sort of um, weaken the West's resolve in providing- Well, okay, uh, but, but the, thing, the, thing, the thing is, is that, um, you know, Russia has a land border with uh, Ukraine, and you know you can drive your your your, your tank army across that, and it, it's not the same thing with China, where you've got to have an amphibious, really a joint operation to get across. So it's not as if they could do like well, like they did with Tibet, where they just roll in there and then you spend a decade putting down guerrillas. So um, it's not quite the same thing. It's it is a very very different military situation. And I'd also add to this that the Russians do have experience rolling not just tank armies, but cavalry armies and everything else across the Ukraine for the last several hundred years. Whereas when was the last time China conducted an amphibious invasion that, that succeeded? Well, there was an attempt, I think, to take some island during the Cold War and it, it failed miserably. And so I don't I, I just can't see that a, a similarity in situation. It would be this huge gamble. I mean, it's like the, the Russian attack on Ukraine was like a two to one attack on the level on hill combat results table. This is like maybe a one to one or a one to two, and that's the odds are too great. And like I say, I don't think they can afford to anything that might risk an aircraft carrier unless they were really, really, really certain they could get across and, and get the thing done. Um, so I, I'd also look at the internal political situation in um, Taiwan because as I understand it, they have two parties there. I mean, coalitions of parties. One is the, uh, the, the it's called usually called the blue, the blues, who are um, uh, uh, basically the uh, Republic of China, the old uh, thing of well, we're the legitimate government of all China. The other are the Greens, who are um, essentially Taiwanese nationalists. Neither of them particularly see any value in surrendering to the mainland. So it just may be they. Both come together to fight it out against the Chinese, uh, the mainland Chinese. So, and by the so way, it's interesting. They call, called blues and greens. That was the name of the two factions in the Byzantine right, yeah. uh, circus who, who, who would always fight it out in the streets of Constantinople. <laughs> yeah, there are, apparently there are two other colors as well, but they were never as, yeah. as politically organized. Right, um, right. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how uh, chariot races can lead to civil war. Um, yes, yes. It was... uh, in Montreal, when the Canadians would win, which is, you know, it, has, it hasn't been for a long time, but once every 10 years they would win, there'd be a giant riot in the downtown right. with young people breaking. So we actually have two questions. Um, uh, okay. One is from uh, Mrs. Farley. Mrs. Farley, would you like to ask the question uh, yourself or would you like me to read it? Uh, sure, I can ask it. So uh, to what extent has... Uh, AUKUS alliance, so, so like with um, Australia and uh, the UK on uh, nuclear powered submarines has affected the abilities of the US and its allies, uh, like considering China and Taiwan? Well, I think, question. yes. Well, from, as I understand it, this has caused some uh, friction. I, I believe it was with the French. I may be wrong because they had wanted to sell submarines. Um, I'd have to double check on that, but it does. Yeah, you know, I believe that they had a contract that was canceled by the alliance or something like that. Right, and it may just reflect a wider, well, at the time, tilt towards the Pacific, and now suddenly we need France because of the situation in Ukraine. It could cause a lot of a lot of issues there, um, but it is kind of interesting that that suddenly. The U.S. is giving uh, Australia a nuclear capability there, which is, you know, that sort of an extra nuclear player. Yeah, I, I, I always thought that the French design was a much more appropriate for um, the Australians. There's a fair bit of um, uh, material on, on the internet that you have all the dysfunctions you have of a peacetime government uh, with people maneuvering to maximize their contract profit. Um, so we have a question. Um, from Mr. Danik, would you like to ask your question or uh, uh, in person? Yeah, this is, hi, I'm Aaron Danis. Um, 
I, I live here in Washington, D.C. Well, I did. I just moved out of Washington to get away from the traffic. Uh, but I teach here in Washington. I just retired from the uh, Intel community. And I'm a young old gamer. I'm 60. I played the old stuff, right? I played uh, Charles Camps' games there and Dave Isby's games. I once had Air War. And, and uh, Joe, I actually used your um, Operation Serval game in a counterterrorism course. I I ran, uh, I actually got the map blown up so I could use it with students around a large table to show them kind of expeditionary, expeditionary counterinsurgency, counterterrorism. And I, I, my question here has to do with Modern War Magazine, which Decision Games canceled. Um, I, I imagine because they weren't selling enough copies um, that would make the most sense. But it, it seems like there's a love-hate relationship with Modern War topics. People want it when something bad happens, right? People are all excited about the Ukraine. It's like, so who's done a game on the Ukraine? And here in Washington, you know, I saw people in the Intel business and people in DOD looking for an off the shelf game, kind of the way Mark Herman had Gulf Strike in the 1991 during the Gulf War. And I just don't get it. I, I, I would think that people would really be hot on modern topics um here in um in in the commercial wargaming side but it doesn't seem to be the case uh, do you have any sense for that have, you know because i've sure. done a lot of them um, well and, and other people can jump in here on this and by modern i don't mean um end of cold war because that's like the hot thing in hobby gaming now everybody's redoing nato and all that great stuff from the from the 70s and 80s i mean truly modern last 10, 15 years? Is it because the topics are so tough, they're not compelling? I don't know. I, I like Serval. I thought that was a great game. Well, okay. Part of it is that you had the Gulf War, which there's a lot of enthusiasm for that in wargaming. And we did some stuff on uh, Afghanistan, too. The problem is these kind of fizzled out after about a decade in terms of being a hot topic. And it was becoming increasingly difficult to find game topics that people really, really wanted to play because, let's face it, we all want the tank armies clashing. Um, so, what's true? And so it just eventually got to the... Also, I think the fact that much of the conflict is low intensity when people are kind of played out on insurgency kind of games. So that kind of lost a lot of interest on that too. But it's unfortunate because I actually I liked it and I thought there's a lot of interesting stuff we did. Uh, let me let me show you one thing here. Hold on. And it's um, funny you mentioned that because I know Volko Runke from in the business, and right. obviously his coin games have been that series has been rather right. successful. But even with that, you know, they did one Afghan game, Distant Plane, which covered right. a key portion, but they've never really updated. The only thing they've kind of updated has been Labyrinth. Right, right, um, and that kind of. With the with essentially withdrawal from the Persian Gulf, there it kind of lost its interest. Um, let me show you something here uh, that we did. If I can find it, come on. Okay, okay. Uh, can people see this on the screen? Uh, no, no. Unfortunately, it's showing. I, I think you want to choose the top left because it's currently showing a, a bar which means okay. uh, we can't see the behind it. Unfortunately, if, if you don't choose the top left, it'll only show one one of multiple windows. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, yeah, now right. we can see it. Oh, this is, this is uh, yeah, I have that right here. This is- uh, Target Iran. Target Iran. Right. Right yeah, this was an attempt to do something uh, to simulate a modern conflict. Target Iran basically mm -hmm. deals with the, um, a, a war with uh, Iran over various stuff. But the idea here is that we used a kind of an unconventional approach. The idea being that, okay, you have a map of Iran in the center, and then you have these uh, alliance on the outside, which is your advance toward it. But it didn't mean so much your military advance as your political advance. And the idea was that, okay, if things get to a certain point, then you launch your attack and you try and take them out. And one of the things, like you notice here, it says straight up Hormoz blocked. And I thought that was kind of clever because it was a way to change the geography of the map. But the central feature of the game is the oil price. If it reached $150 a barrel, the world economy collapses and everybody loses. And the thing that we did with the game was said, okay, uh, use for the start, look up what the current oil price is and use it. And then um, that's your starting point for the game. 
so you can keep it as current. Um, but again, it was because we were trying to do something that wasn't just simply another, you know, um, you know, hex uh, hexagon type of game. And again, we were, we're kind of reaching there, but that was an interesting game. But uh, unfortunately, you know, you, 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 a lot of people want to play these, but not enough to really make it uh, uh, valuable. So commercially viable, I think is the term. <laughs> right, right. Commercially viable. So. It, it, but it, you it, might talk to. Yeah, I'm sorry. You might talk to Dr. Mason because he's done a couple of games that have been um, used at higher echelons. One on um, uh, the Algerian, uh, Algerian Moroccan situation, another on um, the Afghan reconstruction. So I think there's a lot of room out there for these, but perhaps just commercial board gaming isn't isn't the venue, unfortunately. Yeah, too niche. You're right. Thanks. That was, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah that was exactly you. my question. But I was too afraid to ask. Um, uh, it, it, I mean, it, it, I assumed there are. I mean, again, I, I don't want to um, uh, pass a value judgment, but uh, we need more people looking at future possible contingencies than right. replaying the American Civil War or uh, Alexander the Great or World War II. Um, right. And it, it sort of shocked me that it, it is such a very, very small community, which makes me think, who the heck is in charge, right? Um, so, Professor Camps, do you have an experience with that? Uh, no, actually, I, I, I can recall a few things that um, that have uh, that people have come up with. There was a uh, a game put out a long time ago, I guess in the seventies. It was uh, postulated a uh, a new war between Japan and the United States, where uh, Japan resurrected their carrier fleet and um, and became a world power and. Uh, and fought there. And also, um, you've got to look at, say, the, the color-coded U.S. Uh, war plans from uh, from back in the 1930s. They came up with some things that were, um, you know, basically uh, not very feas feasible as far as, 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 as politics go. But, I mean, we actually had war plans for fighting Canada, you know, right. third time's a charm. But uh, we had we had uh, various color coded plans to, to fight other countries that you didn't think you would have to fight. But then again, that's one of those things where I guess they believe that, hey, if something comes up, we don't want to be caught flat footed with without ever thinking about it. So well, I guess you could come up with things that that just don't seem like um, seem like they're very plausible. But uh, but it's something that might somebody might want to try. So, uh, uh, yeah. Professor Miranda, if I could do a follow-up question to, to Mr. Denise, um, is, is it that uh, the the commercial market um, uh, isn't strong because those that are most interested in wargaming are basically trapped uh, in government and therefore can't buy the games commercially? I mean, it, it, I, I would assume that well, there be thousands. I've of known people in government who have used commercial games because um, sometimes that's the only thing available. The one I just put up behind me now is a is a uh, version. It's a Matrix game, and Matrix gaming is popular in the academic side. I use it in classes. This is on South China Sea, and I, I'm actually was encouraged recently because Harold Buchanan's South China Sea game for GMT seems to be doing really well, and it's an influence game. There's no combat in it. If if war breaks out, the game ends. Right? You have to go to a different game system. So. Um, you know, I'm kind of encouraged by that. I guess it, it depends on the topic. If, you, if you're doing if you're doing China, U.S., maybe it's a hot topic, but not if you're doing French intervention into uh, into Mali in 2012, which the French just pulled out now with their tail between their legs because it all went wrong. Sounds familiar, right? Like Afghanistan, you know, a decade later, they end up leaving because it didn't go well. And these are sloppy, dirty um, things to do. Um, uh, there, there are a few other designers who, you know, focus on modern games besides um, Joe here, and I, 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 I keep hoping that uh, you guys are successful. So, Thanks. yeah, same here. Yeah, yes. Well, I think there's a lot in war gaming, and it's, it's just we need to get get more of it out there, and it's just that's therein lies the dilemma. 
but has there been a secular decline? Do you think, I mean, I, I, uh, you may not have sort of had the full 1960s uh, to the current perspective, but has there been a, a secular decline, meaning that there was a, a, a higher per capita proportion of people interested in the 70s and then sort of dropped down? Uh, and that's no, my I, I, I don't think so. I just think that there's so many different sources for war games today that everything started to become diluted. And also you have a lot of people doing desktop publishing. So it's, it's a wide open field. I mean, if you went back to the 70s, you had, you know, two or three companies dominating the whole thing. And then somebody perhaps could turn out something on a mimeograph thing in his basement. But today, there, there's a lot of people involved. Oddly enough, we find that computer games don't compete very much with board games because people want the tactile thing. They want to be able to change the game. They want to, you know, uh, do their own variants. You can't do that with computer games, mostly. Though Vassal has become very popular, which, which is essentially just a computer chessboard, you know, for most of them that where you manually do what you would do on a, on a, on a tabletop, except now you can get, you know, playing opponents who are half a world away to play against. Whereas right. if you don't have anybody who lives in your area, you don't, you don't have to be shunted anymore on in war games. You know. Right, right. Yeah, obviously, I found for games that have a balance of power component where there's a strong personality element to the negotiation, people obviously want to do it in person. Um, but I, I, of course, I use Vassal for the one hour games uh, in my classes, and they're remarkably uh, stable. And, you know, when people cheat, you can track it, obviously. Um, but um, uh, anyone who's got a Mac uh, has, has got three times as many steps to install it. And when I've got 60 students, with 40 of them having Macs, uh, it's a headache uh, uh, in general because Mac users don't know how to use a Mac. Um, that's, is, that's my impression. Um, so, uh, um, uh, David, you had uh, two observations. Would you like to, to, to uh, state them? No, just uh, I just put them there to avoid uh, interfering with uh, the dialogue, but uh, just answering uh, the questions on uh, the uh, Orcus and the submarines, which, you know, and of course the rule of uh, the procurement as signaling to, uh, and on the others, uh, yes, uh, in the 1930s, the best uh, fighter squadron in the U.S. Army Air Corps was in Selfridge Field, Michigan, defending against a uh, bomber threat from uh, Trenton Airfield in Ontario, although the nearest threat bombers were uh, somewhere in England. Yeah, I took my kids to Trenton to see the museum. <laughs> no, it's fascinating. So, um, so I guess tying tying this uh, up, uh, Professor Miranda, um, sure. uh, we have. I mean, you 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 have a um, uh, twenty years ago you designed a game, and it's it's basically still uh, still works. Uh, it, 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 uh, all the components that we see today in Ukraine, you anticipated twenty years ago. Uh, all of, I mean, basically the full spectrum of the uh, the impact of information warfare on inter on on international uh, morale, on uh, uh, the ability to conduct sophisticated maneuvers uh, on the battlefield. All I mean, all I have to do is, is update uh, those particular units uh, to see what the outcome is. Um, but of course, we're still left with the the bigger strategic uh, element, which is what we see with Russia and Ukraine, and that seems to be. Um, the largest determinant of what the uh, of what the uh, outcome is. Um, uh, so, if 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 I could go back and I I raised it in an earlier point, which is, do you see China as a large, fragile, on the edge country in the same way um, that Russia is, or is uh, China's attempt to take Taiwan? You suggested if if China, if China tries to take Taiwan and they fail, they're going to have a governmental collapse. And I'm wondering if that's true. I'm wondering if Taiwan isn't just one of 17 portfolios. Um, I mean, you know, yes, Taiwan, 20 million people, they produce most of the world's very sophisticated chips, but Guangdong province has 120 million people. And about 10 years ago, they produced something like 90% of the world's cell phones. So yeah, it would be the unsophisticated portion of the cell phones, but China's got much, you know, it, it, it has provinces that are much bigger than Taiwan that, that produce things on a much larger scale. Maybe they won't be sophisticated because they won't have the chips. Um, but I'm wondering if, if, 
if China fails in Taiwan, it'll be like China's experience in Korea. It'll be just, ah, um, we did our bit and we, we're just gonna sort of fold in and spend another 10 years and try to figure this out. So is China as vulnerable as uh, Russia, as we imagine? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think that would require a very big psychological survey before I could make such a conclusion. But I do think that the kind of ideologies that motivated everybody back during the 20th century aren't there anymore. And that it just may be the whole world is just on the verge of, a, of some kind of wider collapse. And you might look after the First World War, okay, Russia, you know, uh, Germany and, and uh, Austria-Hungary are collapsed. But then again, there are, there are drastic changes in every other country. So we, we need to look at that a lot more closely. And, you know, it's, as we would say in gaming, it's in the cards. So I, I actually have a, a conjecture that, uh, at least along the coast, the yeah. Chinese population, especially the urban population, are more more progressive and more modern than the Russian population, and that uh, it's actually more difficult for China to start a war. And the consequences would be uh, uh, rather Xi Jinping is uh, far less secure than Vladimir Putin. If, if you see the way that they're they've got these um, very draconian COVID measures, uh, which are completely um, uh, completely alienating the Shanghainese population. Right. That, that's, 30 million, 40 million, 50 million people in the extended metropolitan area. And Xi Jinping is just doing it because he doesn't like uh, uh, Jiang Zemin, who's you know the former pr uh, president who was from there. Um, and so uh, uh, China is actually a lot more fragile. On the other hand, you know, it's, it, these, are, these are very, very difficult things to, um, uh, to examine. So, um, yeah, we have no more questions on the side. So uh, uh, with your permission, uh, Professor Miranda will will uh, conclude this. Thank you so much. Oh, thank I mean, you. You've been sitting on. Well, the thank you to everybody for... who showed up, and I appreciate the questions. And it was good seeing some of the old hands and the new people. So, yeah, you've been sitting on the hot seat for three hours. So, thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> okay. I mean, just so much uh, insight in you know into into the industry, into your yeah. uh, many game designs. We packed in an enormous amount. So, uh, on behalf of the uh, PSSA and the SDS at Concordia University, uh, thank you very much. Professor Miranda. You're welcome. You're welcome. Good stuff, Joe. You're a real thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that.